Alan Winters grew up on a farm in southeast Illinois and is a practicing lawyer. He served aboard carrier USS Coral Sea in Mobile Driving Unit 1, Pearl Harbor, worked as a mining geologist, ran for U.S. Congress, has argued before the jury and appellate courts, both state and federal. Our common law way of life and thought, says Brent, is not only the lifeblood and backbone of our Declaration of 76 and the United States Constitution, but also the object of zeal to deliver our country through the birth pangs of battle to nationhood, and at bottom is still the fellowship that defines Americans to the rest of the world. Keep it, and it will keep your country. Brent has authored the following. Good book, a common lawyer translates and annotates the Bible from the original tongues toward a raw translation of the Bible with over 15,000 footnotes and 123 appendices, tracing major themes throughout the warp and woof of the Bible's text. The comparative law text, excellence of the common law in light of history, nature, and scripture, comparing and contrasting the law of the land, called our common law, and the law of the city, called the civil law. The Declaration of 76 and Constitution of the United States, a common lawyer comments clause by clause. Militia of the several states, our Constitution's answer to its enemies, foreign and domestic, a common lawyer unpacks our Constitution's four militia clauses. Jury handbook, a common lawyer unpacks the origin and duties of the common law juror. Don't talk to the police, the ultimate American weapon, a common lawyer comments. Teach for Freedom, a common lawyer comments concerning the four arts of freedom. Unconditional nature of the Abrahamic covenant, a common lawyer comments. And Magna Carta Unpacked, a common lawyer comments. Brent Allen Winters. <laughs> Responding to Brent's challenge on this title, is Ted R. Wyland, who pastors Christian Covenant Fellowship in Scottsville, Nebraska, and is the evangelistic head of Bible Law versus the United States Constitution and Mission to Israel Ministries. In addition to presiding over an international audio ministry, he lectures throughout the United States, has appeared on television and radio, and has authored 28 books and hundreds of articles. For speaking engagements and interviews, you may be contacted at T. Wyland at BibleVersusConstitution.org. At this time, Ted, you have an opening statement of 15 minutes. You're going to have a little prayer? All right, let's do that. Eric, would you please come here as quickly as you can, please? Yes. I'm going to have you lead us in an opening word of prayer. I apologize, but I just blew right through that, Eric, and I didn't give you some notes. You can use this microphone right here. Heavenly Father, thank you for um, the opportunity to be here tonight to uh, hear these men present their uh, thoughts on <clears throat> those things that you have provided for us, um, the law and the way that it applies to our lives. Please uh, help us to be attentive, uh, give them clear thoughts, um, and please help your truth and your gospel to go out through this event. Uh, to as much of the world as you uh, decree and help it to uh, bear fruit that is in, uh, is very glorifying to you and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, sir. At this time, Ted Wyland has an opening statement of 15 minutes. Okay, stay with us. we got uh, time constraints and we're going to have to do this uh, pretty quick all the way through. I want to first thank Charlie for hosting the event. I want to thank Brent for not only being willing to debate this subject, but it was his idea. So I'm very thankful that he came up with this. And I want to thank all of you who are here uh, in attendance, that you've come, and uh, not only here, and hopefully we're live streaming as well. So we may have a very, very large audience that uh, are in attendance. I want to quickly mention my book table in the back. I want you to know that if you're here on tight strings, and there's anything on my table you want that you just feel like you can't afford, it's yours to take, provided you will use it or you'll use it for someone else. So don't let finances be a problem uh, as far as the books are concerned. There's CDs back there and some tracks as well. I don't usually agree to do debates. I've only done two uh, that I can recall in the past, um, but I'm telling you this topic is 
far, far too important to have declined this debate. One of the reasons I have declined prior invitations to debate is because the subject matter simply didn't justify taking the time from better spent and more productive projects. Not so with tonight's debate. But there's another reason that I declined some of the prior invitations to debate, and that is that in my experience, most people come to debates with their heroes and they simply leave with their heroes. Therefore, I want to implore everyone hearing this debate tonight, regardless the hero you came here to cheer on, whether Brent or me, the fact, and the fact is, neither Brent nor I deserve a hero status. You know, Brent and I are not likely to agree. That's why we're debating on very much tonight. I hope I change his mind. But I'm confident, I'm confident that Brent will agree with me that the only hero tonight should be the one who died for you on a cross and who, and who uh, three days later rose from the grave. Who hopefully you already know as, your, as both Lord and Savior. And who, if he's not already, I hope you leave this debate with, him, with knowing him also as your king. Albeit, the case can be made that if you don't know him as your king, you don't really know him as your Lord and Savior anyway. Now, if you leave this debate with anything else, I want you to know that I have failed in my purpose for agreeing to this debate. And the real loser of this debate will not be Brent or I, but it will be you. This is not just a debate regarding what's true or what's not concerning the subject matter that's being debated. My, I want you to know, my principal incentive and motivation tonight is not to bash the Constitution. Tonight's debate is about the sovereignty, dominion, and kingship of our God and Creator in Christ. Consequently, what you do with tonight's debate may very well be the determining factor of yours and your posterity's destiny both here and now as Americans, and yes, even in turn. Now, I can tell you this. If you're going to walk away from tonight's debate with truth, truth with the potential of setting you free for John 8, 32, regardless whether presented by Brent or me, truth must be paramount with you regardless who presents it. The problem is, we have all walked into this auditorium with preconceived prejudices. And from several years of experience addressing the subject at hand, we're talking about emotionally charged prejudices or biases. Thus, if you're going to leave this debate with Christ as your king and the truth regarding the Constitution's biblical compatibility, you must determine tonight, right here and now, to lay aside both your emotions and your prejudices, fully prepared to sacrifice them on the altar of truth. Otherwise, regardless of presented, otherwise, truth, whether presented by Brent or myself, will be sacrificed on the altar of your emotions and prejudices. And once again, you will be the loser of this debate. Now, as for Brent and me, we both, I'm telling you, we both have monumental tasks before us tonight. What makes my task so monumental is that in the next three hours, I've got to overcome what amounts to 233 years of propaganda, ironically championed mostly by alleged Christians, hand in hand with a lot of Mormons. Propaganda, and some of you may not like this, but propaganda that's led to idolatry, constitutional idolatry. And idols die hard. If for no other reason that we've often yet to identify from it. And to prove the point that idols die hard, in Acts chapter 19, we're informed that the Ephesians cried out for two hours. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Diana was one of their gods. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great, think about this. Two solid hours of that. Incredible. Well, uh, America. Ironically, led by Christians, have been crying out for 230 plus years. Great is the Constitution of the Americans. Great is the Constitution of the Americans for 230 years. 
The task before me tonight is indeed monumental. My task in the next three hours is to overcome 230 years of emotional and constitutional propaganda. But frankly, Brent's task tonight is even more monumental. Because Brent pretty much, without the aid of quotations from the framers and the founders themselves, if Brent attempts to convince you that the Constitution is biblical by Christian or biblical sounding quotations from the 18th century founding fathers, you should pay them little attention. Or no heed whatsoever in for two reasons. First, because the debate we agreed upon, the debate we agreed upon is not about anything the framers said about the Constitution but instead the biblical compatibility of the Constitution itself. In other words, Brent's case has to be made from the Constitution and, of course, the Bible, as does mine. The second reason you should pay no heed to such Christian or biblical-sounding quotations, either here tonight or anywhere else someone attempts to, uh, to employ them as alleged evidence of the biblical compatibility of the Constitution, is because of what Christ declared in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, overhead number 2. Uh, overhead number two, please. I guess we lost the screen back there. Okay. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Read it with me. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And he will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And this is Christ speaking. He says, And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, me you who practice lawlessness. Just because, for example, Aaron named the, his golden calf Yahweh didn't mean his act of idolatry somehow became acceptable. Cherry picked his quotations that even Obama could be made to look like a Christian. We're not here tonight to debate what the framers personally wrote or said that allegedly can and often is employed in an attempt to make them look Christian. We're here tonight to debate the biblical compatibility of the Constitution itself. That will ultimately prove, per 721, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, whether the founders' Christian-sounding quotations actually are Christian or biblical. In other words, the quotations of the founders are proven true by the Constitution, not the other way around. Back to Brent's dying task. Brent's dying task tonight is to try to convince you that a godless, Christless, biblically lawless document, both in what it does and does not say, is somehow a godly, biblical, Christ-honoring document. And or, in trying to tie in the Constitution to the Declaration of Independence, that therein does cite God and Creator, convince you contrary to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 and 2, 2 John chapter 1 verses 7 through 11, that the generic God and Creator of Thomas Jefferson, the chief architect of the Declaration of Independence, who cut the virgin birth of Christ, his miracles, his resurrection, and the ascension of Christ out of this cut and paste New Testament. What in a letter to John Adams, dated January 24th, 1814, Jefferson described as a dunghill. That's right. Thomas Jefferson described the virgin birth, resurrection, and ascension of Christ as a dunghill. And in so doing, depicted our Savior the one found in the unedited New Testament in the very same fashion. Overhead number three, please. I want to just post that because I know for some people that's going to seem extremely incredible that I can make such a statement about John Adams. There is the documentation. It is also found in the, the big book, Bible Law versus the United States Constitution, the Christian Perspective, in which I examine every article and every amendment by the Bible. That, that quote and that the documentation will be found in that as well. If you don't get it down, and I see some are already writing. So you can get that out of the book. We can even get it back at my table later. All right. When Brent or anyone else attempts to tie the Constitution with the Declaration of Independence, as I think he might be planning to do, as evidence that the Constitution is biblical, they have likewise to convince you that Thomas Jefferson and Jefferson's Enlightenment and Masonic buddies, generic God and Creator, is one and the same as the God of the, God of the Bible. Despite what we find in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 3, 3 and 16, and 2 John 1, 7 through 11. Uh, overhead number 4, please. Okay, I'm, I'm going to run on my time here, but 
try to get, get a hold of what's being put. Well, let's just do it. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Jump down to 2 John 2. For many plural deceivers, don't, don't miss that, are entered into the world to confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Jesus Christ this time has come in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Whoever transgresses the Bible not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. Note that. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he is both the Father and the Son. If there are any that come unto you and bring not this doctrine, we see him not into your personal house, state, state house, white house, senate house, as the house of representatives. Neither bid in God's speed, for he that biddeth in God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. What we find in these two passages demonstrates that Thomas Jefferson was not only a non-Christian, but Thomas Jefferson was an antichrist, as were many of the contemporary founding fathers. Based upon the definition of an antichrist in 2 John chapter 2 or chapter 1 verses 7 through 11. What else would you call someone who describes the virgin birth, resurrection, and ascension of Christ a dumb deal? These two passages also demonstrate you don't want to hit your way into theirs. Lest, as it says in the bottom there, you find yourself complicit in their wicked antichrist deeds. Consequently, I contend that neither Founders' quotations, nor Antichrist uh, Jefferson's Declaration of Independence can be used as evidence that the godless, Christless, and biblically lawless Constitution is a godly, Christ honoring, honoring, and biblically compatible document. And therefore, if Brennan is to make his case tonight, he must do so from the Constitution itself. Okay. Got through that faster than I thought. Okay, stay tuned because uh, the next, in the next three hours, they may very well prove to be three of the most important hours of your life. Because to get this issue wrong has eternal implications as it pertains to your relationship with the King of Kings. Thank you.
here. We don't want to engage in one upmanship. We just want to tell it the way we see it to a couple of fellows that have looked at it very closely. I say that I substantially agree with the Constitution of the United States. I substantially agree with the Constitution of the United States. Why do I say that? Because the Constitution of the United States is not the Bible. Now, I don't know how far Ted can go with this, but we approach this, he did a good job laying this out, we approach this as whether or not the Constitution of the United States is biblical. That means we have to go to the Bible to show what the Bible says concerning the truth. And if that's true, of course, uh, I would want you to know, as I lay out a little bit of a roadmap here, who I am and where we're going with this. I don't want to hide the ball at all. I want to come right up here right now and say what my arguments are. It is my conviction, and I'm fully persuaded on good evidence, that the Bible is without error as to fact. The Bible is without error as to fact in its autographs. Let me add that. I think Ted and I both agree the Bible is reliable. I've listened to him enough to know that he takes that point of view. Uh, about inerrancy, I don't know how far he can go with it. That's how far I go. And that's not to say that everything the Bible says is said and done ought to have been said and done. Let me repeat that. Everything the Bible says was said and done. Not all of it ought to have been said and done, because not all of it was somebody telling the truth. But it is true, the doctrine that we call of inerrancy says that everything the Bible says was said and done, was said and done just the way the Bible says it was said and done. That's the doctrine of inerrancy. And you have to decide. Sometimes the Bible doesn't tell you. The historical books doesn't tell us that. For instance, the book of Acts. He lays out the facts. You talk about the facts. Luke major on facts, historic facts. He lays them out. He doesn't tell you whether they were right or wrong, up or down. In the books of Samuel and Kings do the same thing in many instances. But everything the Bible says was said and done, was said and done just the way the Bible says it was said and done. That's my position. And I'll be arguing from that point of view. Ted holds, and I gather this from all of Ted's lectures in his book, Ted holds that the Constitution of the United States introduces a false God. We the people. That's fundamental to what he teaches. He also teaches that the Constitution of the United States promotes a false law from that false God. It is true. You've got a different God, you've got a different law. What is law? Law among all men at all times has always been had the same definition. Law is the will of the sovereign. The question is, who's the sovereign? Ted says the Constitution of the United States inserts we the people as the sovereign. I disagree. I believe this premise is wrong. Second, he says that there's a false law from this false God called we the people. The preamble of the Constitution says we the people. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, you ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. Who are we the people? It's not a false God. That would be my position. Ted then teaches third, and this follows on the heels of those first two points that the Constitution of the United States purports to elevate that false law from that false God. In other words, the Constitution of the United States being the false law in his view. It seeks to elevate it above the law, the law, the will of the sovereign that James calls the true law. I disagree is because, again, in all three cases, I believe that Ted starts from a false premise. So Ted's logic is okay. Ted reasons out of those false premises. But if you start with a false premise, a false thing that you believe that is not true, 
You may not get it to the truth. The Constitution of the United States, I use this as an example, says, or the Declaration of 76. The Declaration of 76 is not a Declaration of Independence, so the words are not found anywhere in the document. It's called that. It's a Declaration of Dependence, shifting dependence from the crown of England to the supreme judge of all the world. It says it just that way. But that document, the Declaration of Independence, says that, says that we hold these truths to be self-evident. What does that mean? That means this is so obvious that we're not even going to prove it. It doesn't need proof. They're all men created equal, that they are endowed by their great Lord with certain unalienable rights, but among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, he said. He starts that. I'm using this as an example right now. That's the way all reasoning has to happen. You have to start. If you don't start with something you assume without proving it, as the courts say, take judicial notice of it, judge, it's raining outside, look out the window. Oh, my James, it is. I'll take judicial notice of that. It's raining outside. We don't need to have evidence to prove that. Well, that's what the Declaration of 76, that Paul says there when it says we hold these truths to be self-evident. Uh, Romans chapter 1, Paul, the apostle in that epistle, he says, he starts, by the way, in Romans, is a book about <laughs> Paul, the apostle, outdoes himself being the logician in that book. As Peter says, it's hard to understand, Paul. As Felix said, uh, his education made him mad. <laughs> now, that may have been true in some ways, I don't know. That's what Felix said. Now, it may not have been true, but Felix did say it. The Bible says he said it, and he said it. That's the doctrine of inerrancy. But it says in Romans 1 that the wrath of God is continually being poured out from the skies against all ungodliness. And the righteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. That's what he assumes, and he does not attempt to prove it. Because he said, This is so obvious, it doesn't require any proof. Well, I'm just making a point, using an example from the Bible, from the Declaration of 76, that that's the way men have to think. They don't make choice, and they do without even thinking about it. Uh, Ted has done that. Ted is reasoning and sound. He just starts with the wrong premise. That's my conclusion. The Constitution cannot be an idol. Not only is it not an idol, it can't be according to the Bible. That's not even possible. Hope we get to that. Finally, the Constitution of the United States is a brief of common law government. The Constitution of the United States is a brief of common law government. The Constitution of the United States did not fundamentally change anything in America. Not fundamentally. We didn't have a revolution, it's called that. No, revolution changes things. What we said was, we want to keep what we've got, our common law. That's what that was all about. Because with the common law comes the recognition of the right, the duty to keep and carry a gun, the duty to speak freely when God wants you to. The duty, that's what the word right means, duty. It's an old Anglo word, an old Danish Jewish word. The modern world is hijacked. Well, the German tongue still uses it that way. You've heard the word right. The third right. It's about duty. Our common law, they used to call it, and uh, over on the continent, before those tribes came to Britain, they called it the Volk. Right. What does that mean? Both. That, we say both. That means people. And right means duty. Well, the Constitution of the United States is a brief of common law government. Now, what does that mean? Well, that, well if it is a brief of common law government, is that biblical? That's the question we want to explore. And we hope that the things that we bring out will do that. Now, quick road map. This is we agreed on. Uh, Ted would have opening comment, I would have opening comment. Then Ted give 20 minutes of an argument, main argument. Brent, that's me, will rebut Ted's argument, and then Ted will get a rebuttal to my argument. Why? Because Ted is a prosecutor. I'm the defense 
Because that's where your proof has to come from, from that doctrine. On the other hand, had Brian challenged me to debate the biblical compatibility of the Constitution that I'm in part going to show you momentarily, I'd have been an absolute fool to debate him. Brent would have won the debate before we ever got to this auditorium. Let's read a portion of it together. Overhead number seven, please. Article seven, section one. That's not what I want. Let's, uh, does that? Yeah, turn the page two much. Nope. Uh, let's go to the next one. That's not it. Okay, here we go. Fundamental agreement of the colony in New Haven, Connecticut. 1639 agreement. We all agree that the scriptures hold forth a perfect rule in the, excuse me, for the direction and government of all men and duties which they are to perform to God and to man as well as families and all public offices which concern civil order as choice of magistrates and officers making and repealing laws, dividing allotments of inheritance, and all things of like nature. We will, all of us, be ordered by the rules which the scripture holds forth. And we agree that such persons being entrusted with such matters of government are described in Exodus 18.21, Deuteronomy 1.13, with Deuteronomy 17.15, and 1 Corinthians 6, 1, 6, and 7. Now that is a biblically compatible document. Some of the testimonies to this same constitution are as equally impressive as the New Haven Agreement itself. Overhead number eight, if you will. This is from Alexis de Tocqueville. Many of you have heard of Alexis to Tocqueville who wrote Democracy in America. I'm not going to take the time to read that. You'll also find that in its documentation in the in, uh, Bible Law versus the United States Constitution. Uh, let's go overhead number nine. I want to make sure we read this one. This is from McGuffey's elected, sixth elected reader, American's most popular school book in the 1800s, also testified to America's early form of theocratic government. This is referring right back to not only New Haven, Connecticut's uh, constitution, but some of the others as well. He says, there, the early Puritans' form of government was strictly theocratical in so much that it would be difficult to say where there was any civil authority among them, distinct from ecclesiastical jurisdiction. Whenever a few of them settled a town, they immediately gathered themselves into a church. And their elders were magistrates, and their code of law was the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. God was their king, and they regarded him as truly and literally so. And there is the documentation for that quote as well. You see, America does have biblical roots. America does. But they are not to be found in the late seven, or excuse me, 18th century Enlightenment America, but rather in the early 17th century Puritan America. So, what's Brent to do now? in trying to make the Constitution biblically compatible. The only thing left for him to do, he has to now take components of the Constitution that appear biblical, and in some cases are biblical, and claim those components then make the Constitution a biblically inspired and compatible document. The element of the Constitution most commonly used in my, in my experience to declare the Constitution biblical is its three branches the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. And when it's used to allegedly prove the Constitution is biblical, those using this element of the Constitution for this purpose will invariably point you to Isaiah 33, 22 as evidence. Overhead number 10. Isaiah 33, 22. For Yahweh is our judge, Yahweh is our lawgiver, Yahweh is our king. So there you have it. There you have it. Scriptural proof that the United States Constitution is not only biblically compatible, but biblically inspired. Well, if that's the case, if that's the case, then the Constitution which, from which the following comes, we'll have it up in a minute, is also a biblically inspired document for the very same reason. Overhead number 11, I left out the government intentionally to begin with. Next overhead, please. Constitution, oh, we'll have to go back one. Back one. Oh, okay. Um, uh, well, yes, okay, that's okay. Well, no, that, I messed that up. But let me read it to you. State, here is it, here it is. State power in the, and I left out the government, shall be exercised on the basis of its division into legislative, executive, and judicial authority. Same order as the United States Constitution. Besides, or excuse me, bodies of legislative, executive, and judicial authority shall be independent. 
And the quote, would anyone like to venture a guess what nation's constitution that's from? That comes from Section 1, Chapter 1, Article 10 of the Constitution of the Russian Federation, which was adopted on December 12, 1993, abolishing the Soviet system of government. Thus, if the U.S. Constitution republics three branches prove, allegedly prove the Constitution is biblical, then we're also compelled to declare that Russia's current Constitution is likewise biblically compatible. The fact is, by that standard, there's hardly a constitution in existence, almost invariably that use all three of those branches, that's not then biblical, including the 1936 constitution of the Soviet Socialist Republics, inspired by Marx and Lenin, as evidenced in Chapter 2, Chapter 5, and Chapter 9, respectively addressing the legislative, executive, and judicial branches, and once again in the very same order as the United States Constitution. And how much more so a constitution that quotes scripture? Something the United States Constitution does not do. Certainly a constitution that quotes scripture, such as 2 Thessalonians 3.10, if any man would not work, neither should he eat. Such a constitution would have to be biblical, right? Well, guess what? Guess what if, or excuse me, guess what? If that's true, then you, again, identify the 1936 constitution of the Soviet Social Socialist Republics as being a biblical document because therein is found 2 Second, Second, Second Thessalonians 3 10. Overhead number 12 now, please. Okay, Constitution. Oh, yeah, that was the one. Constitution of the United Union of the Soviet Social Republics, December 5th, 1936, Chapter 1, Article 12. In the USSR, work is a duty and a matter of honor for every able bodied citizen in accordance with the principle. There's the quote He who does not work, neither shall he eat. You can also find the following biblically compatible components in the 1993 Constitution of the Russian Federation. Section 1, Chapter 2, Article 19, Equality Before the Law. <coughs> Section 1, Chapter 2, Article 20, Protection for the Life of Everyone. Section 1, Chapter 2, Article 20, Capital Punishment for Murders. Section 1, Chapter 2, Article 49, Innocence Until Proven Guilty, etc. And there's, there's many others that are biblically compatible. So, does these biblically compatible components mean the Constitution of the Russian Federation is a biblically inspired and even biblically compatible document? Well, of course not. Now, you can go online and find lists with a number of similar type components extracted from the United States Constitution with accompanying scriptures added that allegedly prove the United States Constitution is biblical, as can be done with any nation's constitution, even Soviet Russia's. But just because there are components in a constitution that are biblical does not make, a biblically, make it a biblically compatible document. Not when the same document is riddled with components that are not only biblically adverse, but biblically seditious. Case in point, the United States Constitution in which there's hardly an article or amendment that's not antithetical in some fashion or biblically seditious to the, to, to, uh, to, uh, or biblically seditious, I'll leave it at that. That's the reason for this book, where I have again uh, examined every article and every amendment by the Bible. Not only is it impossible for Brent to prove the biblical compatibility of the Constitution from the Constitution itself, which is what he must do here tonight, Making his task even more daunting is that he also has to prove that the Constitution is not unbiblical. Because any Constitution that's unbiblical is also a Constitution that's biblically incompatible. For one example, out of the myriads of examples, again, found, find them in this book. Overhead number 13. Isaiah 33, 22, for Yahweh is our judge, Yahweh is our lawgiver, Yahweh is our king. James 4, 12, there is only one lawgiver. Isaiah 33, 22, the very scripture that's most often employed to allegedly prove the Constitution is biblical provides instead some of the most damaging evidence against the Constitution. Isaiah 33, 22, along with James 4, 12, informs us that there's only one lawgiver or legislative, if you prefer. Consequently, only the lawgiver's law is, is true law. And yet, 
in total disregard of Isaiah 33, 22, the constitutional framers in Article 1 made it possible for any Tom, Dick, or Harry to be a legislator. Making matters even worse, his article, in Article 6, the framers banned Christian tests by which mandatory biblical qualifications for civil leaders were also eliminated. Have you ever wondered how, how in the world is it that America has ended up with the caliber of rulers we have today? Well, once, I'm telling you, once Article 6 was ratified, it was inevitable that America would end up with nothing but nincompoops, scoundrels, incompetents, immoral reprobates, and outright criminals for her leak, for her quote-unquote leak. Sound familiar? The list? Perhaps best depicted by the prophet Micah, overhead 14. Micah 7, 14. The best of them is like a briar, and the most upright of them is like a thorn hedge. Not to mention all of the foul, unbiblical legislation acted by those um, uh, biblically seditious legislators made possible by the Constitution, including Roe versus Wade, and Obergefell versus Hodges that legalized sodomite quote-unquote marriages. One of the dumbest things the framers did was to usurp Yahweh's exclusive election authority for Deuteronomy 17, 10, and 15, and thereby turning election quote-unquote discretion over to we the people. The majority of whom, according to Christ in Matthew 7, 13, are in the Broadway leading to destruction. Just where do you suppose the Broadway destruction bunch are going to take America? Perhaps to the precipice of moral depravity and destruction. Precisely where America finds herself today. Now, being we're talking about Article 6 Christian test ban and the appalling civil quote-unquote leaders and their legislation and adjudication gets inflicted upon America, let's also talk about Article 6 claim that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Overhead number 15. Article 6, Clause 2, the Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made in which shall be, shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Question, how many supreme laws can there be at one time? The very definition of the word supreme dictates singularity and exclusivity. There can only be one supreme law at any given time. Therefore, you and I have two choices today as what is the supreme law, the United States Constitution for Article 6, or Yahweh's moral law for the Bible. Choose carefully, because to choose wrong is an act of idolatry. Idolatry is not so much about statues, but about statutes, what, such as what one considers the supreme law of the land. And to attempt to meld the two is to choose the lesser of the two. Which harkens us back to the double-minded Israelites with Elijah on Mount Carmel, overhead number 16. Now you'll note that I've changed what he said a little bit, but not so much. He says, why halt you between two opinions? If we the people, which is a contemporary form of Baal. I've got a, I've got a blog article entitled, Could You Be a Disciple of Baal and Not Know It? If we the people be God, follow them. If Yahweh be God, follow him. I suggest it's time to choose between the document that begins we the people and the one that begins in the beginning God. To choose the United States Constitution or any other surrogate law as supreme is the ultimate in biblical sedition. Because you cannot reject the king's law as supreme without at the same time rejecting the king of kings himself as supreme. In other words, Article 6 alone proves that the Constitution is not only biblically incompatible, but in fact biblically seditious. Now let's quickly also talk about Amendment 1, Article 17, or, or Overhead 17, please. Amendment 1, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech and so forth and so on. Ironically, Amendment 1 is the component of the Constitution that Christians hang their head on probably more than any other, and yet, like Article 6, it's one of the most biblically egregious components of the entire Constitution. 
I am confident that everyone here listening, whether here or, or um, online, um, not, that there's not a person in attendance who's not justifiably concerned about the Muslim invasion of America, including Muslims now serving as America's civil rulers. Two questions. Question number one, are, are anti-Christians and non-Christian Muslims, etc., occupying positions of civil leadership in America the result of the Bible's biblical qualifications for civil leadership, or because those same qualifications were eliminated with Article 6 of the, with Article 6 Christian testimony? Clue, it wasn't because of the Bible's qualifications. Question number two, is America's landscape today dotted with mosques, synagogues, and temples devoted to God's, not Yahweh, the God of the Bible, because of the First Commandment or because of the First Amendment? Clue, it's not because of the First Commandment. It's one thing to allow individual freedom of conscience and private choice of God. It's another matter altogether for government to enable any and all religions proliferate through the land to proselytize our posterity to false gods. And that's what the First Amendment legitimizes. It's an unequivocal violation of the First Amendment. And the polar opposite of the following First Commandment statute over hut number 18. This is Jeremiah 2, 3rd, no, there should be one before that. Try it. Well, we've lost it. I'll read it to you. Exodus 34, 13 through 15. I've got it here. It says that you shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god, for Yahweh, Yahweh is a jealous god, lest thou or your children go pouring yes. after other gods. Consequently, if you promote the Constitution as the law of the land, you're complicit in America's destruction at the hands of Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Sodomites, lesbians, quote-unquote transgender, and other non-Christians and anti-Christians, empowered by Article 6 and Amendment 1, and much worse. Much worse, you're committing sedition against Yahweh as sovereign, and thus His moral law as supreme.
50 several states of the United States. Now you say, I don't agree with you, friend. Well, I'm not here to make you agree. I'm just here to deliver the facts. That's what I've discovered, and I know it's true out of the Bible. And I know that that's what that phrase means in the Constitution of the United States because that came to us from our Puritan and Scotch-Irish and German and Dutch Reformed forebears. And they all believed this fundamentally the same thing. They were Reformed. What does that mean? That means they believe in those doctrines that are foreign to much of Christendom today. That's what that means. They believe that they were under a covenant of God. They believe that God was absolutely sovereign and you couldn't call his hand. They believe that God chose men. Men don't choose God. No, they believe what Paul the Apostle said, that men run from God, that the poison of asps is under their lips, he says in Romans. They have all gone out of the way. They are all unprofitable. He's acting as a prosecuting attorney to conclude all men under law breaking and doomed. That means irreversible judgment. That's, that's what the people means, though. It refers to the militia, as our Constitution would put it, the militia of the several states of the United States. You say, well, it's not that way today, is it? Well, I'm not making that argument. I'm talking about the Constitution of the United States and the simple understanding of the people that put it in place. It's a brief, a brief on the law government. Chief Justice Pat of the U.S. Supreme Court had it right when he said, he did say it, he said the Constitution of the United States is a, is a document of common law government and here's the phrase, compact draft. It explains nothing. It doesn't, it doesn't, he used the word dollar, it didn't tell you what dollar is. It says trial by jury, it doesn't unpack all the due process of how to handle the jury doesn't have any of that. Why? Because it's a brief of common law government. It is what men have called in the past. It is dogmatic. It just states without support, without explaining. Why? So it would be simple enough for us to deal with. Oh, by the way, the Constitution of the United States, watch me close on this one. The Constitution of the United States is not based upon the Bible. Let me repeat it so you don't miss it. <laughs> the Constitution of the United States is not based upon the Bible. Well, then what's it based upon? Now let's read it here. Psalm chapter 19. Now I'm reading from what folk call the winterized version of the Bible. Uh, I call it raw translation. I don't want to cook the book. You can follow along in your, if you have a Bible, King James, King Jimmy version, whatever version you've got. This is the way I see it. Psalm 19, verse 1. The skies are telling of lawgiver's deemed worth, and the fixed span is displaying his handiness. Day to day it bubbles speech. You can just see the bubbling and twinkling of the stars. And night and the night, Alive in his first hand knowledge. There is no speech and there is no arranged word which their sound wears not out of being heard. They're stretched out web as going forth in all the land and their verbal acts and to the end of the city law world. That's not the law of the land, friends, neighbors, and kin. That's the law of the city he's talking about. He put a tent in them for the sun, and it like a bridegroom coming forth from his chamber, like a warrior thrills to run a course, run a course. That's significant. God's law is a way pointed out, the way pointed out at the index finger. That's what the word Torah means in the verb form, and it only appears once in the Old Testament. Torah, the way pointed out. Jesus Christ said, did Jesus Christ say on a list of laws? He said, I'm away. That word is, is better, Odops, better translated road. A road, roadway. A wagon path, not a footpath. A wagon path to get on and walk. That's what Jesus Christ said he is. That's what the law of God is, the true law of the true lawgiver. Let's go on. Verse 6 is going forth from the far end of the skies and is coming around over the far ends of it. There is nothing.
nothing being hidden from his keep. Verse 7, he shifts. He shifts from talking about nature, from astronomical ideas to literary ideas. He says, he happens. That's what Yahuwah means, Yahuwah. It's a three-syllable word. It's the name of God. It means he happens. He's the happening one. That's what it means. We should translate it so we understand who he is. He happens, his way pointed out, is sound. That means it's, it's tamim. It's unblemished. It isn't blind or tall. The same word used to describe the sacrifices, the sheep and the goats, that God, he said, he said, if you bring a sacrifice, it better not be blemished. Tamim. It says of Noah that he was the only one untamim in his generations. Unpolluted. That's what he says in the word of God here. The written word. Returning a breathing soul. The evidence of he happens. That's our God. The old Germanic people said Jehovah, but it's not her, it's Yahuwah. It's one of those few words we can know how to pronounce. There's only two options. It's either Yahuwah or Yehovah. It can't be anything else. Statues of He Happens right gladly in the heart desire, and the end result commanded of He Happens is pure, enlightening the eyes, shine from displeasing He Happens, clean, enduring forever. Courses of fair play. That's what our common law is. Our common law is due process. Our common law is due process. Listen, we don't have jurisdiction as men. God has not given us jurisdiction as men to declare the end result standard. Do not cut a lie, steal, commit adultery, or murder your neighbor. Do not cut a lie, steal, commit adultery, or murder your neighbor. Those are end result standards. By the way, that's the last five of the Ten Commandments in reverse order. Unfortunately, for some people, I learned how to learn them that way. Just like I learned the harmonica. You know, you're supposed to flip it one way to play it, and I put the bass on the wrong end. But it plays okay. And I would memorize it that way because, well, it's a strange set of circumstances that happen. It's not our jurisdiction to decide the result standard. What does the Bible say? Fear not the face of any man, whether he be rich, poor, or weak. For the judgment, the end result standard, is a who? Yahuwah. Translated in the King James Bible, the Lord. The Lord, not a Lord, the Lord. The end result standard belongs to him. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 18, if you follow my course of process, we call it due process, our Constitution calls it due process, our Constitution of the United States has no end result standards. Our Constitution of the United States is a document of process, of due process. You see the word in the Old Testament translated, or translated judgment. The command, statutes and judgments. Mishpah, translated the judgment. That word means due process. It doesn't mean the end result. They have another word for end result. The Hebrew word din means the pronouncement. Mishpah means the process. Of course, the way, isn't that what Jesus Christ said? The Christian life is a way, it's a course to be followed. It's not do this, don't do that. No, it's not. Because if you follow the course, what will happen? You'll accomplish the due processes or the end result standard that God wants in every individual instance. So Matthew 18, Jesus Christ said, He said, if you do this, you follow this process I laid out here. And there's two or three of them together, together. Whatsoever is, whatsoever you, decision you come to, if you follow the process, has already been bound in heaven. Not would be bound, but has already been bound because the will of God, the law of God is from eternity past to eternity present in every individual instance and in every conflict. It's our job to find it. That's where our common law, we don't say well, of course, we, it's said sometimes, but more often, historically, we say, what are the findings of the jury? Findings, what are they, they looking for? They're looking for that this is our, our culture. This comes to us from a long line of who we are. We don't make law. We find the 
result that God has already in his mind, and there never was a time he didn't have. In individual instances. Matthew 18. It's a course. The Constitution does not provide any result standards. It doesn't talk about rape, sodomy, kidnapping. It, it leaves that up to the police powers of the states of the United States. They declare the Constitution of the United States is a document about how things are to be done. Not what is to be done. That's God's domain. We don't have that jurisdiction. But God has given jurisdiction to us to follow the process. I go into court. All I can do, really, all I can do, and this is all I ever do. I don't fight over what the law, what the end result is. I fight over, wait a minute, this fellow, this fellow was forced to testify against his will. That violates his right to remain silent. A common law recognized duty, by the way. A common law recognized, it's not recognized in the rest of the world. The right to keep and bear arms not recognized in the rest of the world. Why? Because that goes to how we live. How, not what. How? Well, yeah, I get fired up. See, I had all this stuff written down, and I haven't even got to it yet. Well, Vince Lombardi. You remember Vince? In my day, he was a big deal. He coached a team up in Green Bay that won the world championship in professional football three times. Vince used to start every, every season. I hear tell I wasn't there. Big enough. Well, I played football because I've been in school small enough where I could. I only weighed 135 pounds at that time. But Vince would get all the rookies and all the veterans out and they start spring training and he'd have them sit on the grass and he'd hold up a football. And he'd say, This, gentlemen, is a football. And then he'd say, The fundamentals, gentlemen, we're not going to get beyond. And nobody in life does get beyond the fundamentals. They just learn how to use them better as they go. Hebrews chapter 5. That's what it said. Well, the Constitution is not based upon the Bible. They just read Psalm 19. Psalm 19 is divided into two parts. It has a total, you can see there, if you've got it in front of you, 14 verses. The first six verses are about, about what God has given to us in the world around us. And we are to observe it and use it to our advantage. The Word of God, this verses 7 to the end of the psalm, is dropped in to that, to that context. And to ignore that context is to ignore entirely the application of the Word of God. Our common law is the context of relationships between things and things, Men and things, men and men, and our common law says do it this way, follow this course. John Bunyan had it right, Pilgrim's Progress, 14 years in prison, he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. It's called Pilgrim's Progress because he got on course, away, and he stayed on it. He didn't write a book about do this, don't do that. Christianity is not a moral word. I agree with A.D. Bruce. It's not a moral order. It's a providential order. Fundamentally, is there rights and wrongs? Oh, yes. But if you will follow the course, and that's what our common law is. Without our common law, we don't have that. The Constitution of the United States is a brief of common law government. This Psalm chapter 19, the first seven verses are about the laws of nature. Our Declaration of 76 calls it the laws of nature. Under Lex non scripta, says Blackstone, unwritten in the nature of things. We live by it. I don't step out of what Greyhound bus is going 60 miles an hour. I'd be dead. Why? Because I've observed the laws of nature. God gave you. There is two laws that our maker, the maker of all things, has given us. The laws of nature are written in the nature of things. Lex non scripta, and the laws of nature is God written. In the Bible, the first half of Psalm 19 is about. The laws of nature are unwritten. That's what we call our common law. We call it the whole right. We call it the, we used to call it, we, our forebears, call it the laws of Edwin, the confessor, the laws of King Alfred, before that, they call it the Mumultine laws of the 
1,800 years ago. Without that, the rights and wrongs that we know about do not come to lie still, commit adultery, or murder your neighbor. How do we decide how to deal with those? We do it through due process. By the way, of course, the way things are done. And our Constitution of the United States is that our common law is the observations of men. Often we think of it in courts, and the evidence presented, and make observations of what has happened. And then they apply the law. The common law, let me repeat it where it started. The common law is not based on the Bible, and the Bible is not based on the common law. They are two, two volumes coming down from the skies, separately, fully compatible, mutually supportive. And if there's anything in our common law that we say is true that isn't, well, it's not true. If there's anything in the Constitution that says that it is not true, and there are some things, for example, I've heard Ted talk about Professor Fraser in the book you wrote, I interviewed Professor Fraser in the long ago. And he said there's one part of the Constitution that I don't think is limited. He teaches at Master's College out in California. I said, what is it? He said, the First Amendment is not limited. Not all of it, some of it is. Well, I don't know that I agree with him about that, but the point I know is true. The Constitution of the United States is not the Bible. The Constitution is not the Bible. It is the observations, observations of men over many centuries put together. Thank you. Put together for our benefit. And God demands you to do that. Hebrews chapter 5 says that. And to ignore the one volume is to ignore the other. We're going to ask questions a little bit, and maybe we can flesh some of this out a little more. Thank you very much. Ted, you have 10 minutes to rebut Brent's main argument. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, it's important that we again recognize what this debate is about. It, it's, uh, the debate is clearly established as being about is the Constitution biblically compatible. I want you to note here that that's yet to be proven, even close to being proven by anything that Brandon said. He's giving some theory about, about, about uh, common law and some other things and about his translation, and I, I'm going to have to give a copy of that. I like it. His translation of Psalms 19 and, and uh, such, but he has not proven or demonstrated at the, to this point that the Constitution itself is biblical. That has to be proven from the Constitution. Brent also made the point of saying it's not even possible that the Constitution is the problem. Men are the problem. Well, of course, I believe men, men are the problem. Men, perhaps such as the prayers, um, could they have been the problem? But I don't completely agree with him that the, the Constitution cannot be the problem any more than to say that that the God bails or the or the document that established Baal as or or the God uh, Dagon in the Old Testament as the God of the Philistines or the God of the Canaanites um, is not the problem. Now, the, you know, granted, the real problem is the ones who created the document, but. If there's a problem with those who created the document, then there's probably a problem with the document itself as well. And thus, you cannot just dismiss the document because men are the problem. You know, I hear it all the time that, you know, the Constitution is not the problem. It's all these judges and these congressmen who have, who have changed the Constitution, who have, who have uh, adjudicated and legislated in such a way as to, as to be... Uh, uh, opposed or in a, in a way that's contrary to the Constitution. Well, let me go back to the previous point I made. How did we end up with such men in America to adjudicate and legislate, not so importantly against the Constitution, but against God's laws? But if you want to say it's not the Constitution's project, it's the it's the uh, it's the, 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 the modern day judges and. And uh, congressmen, they're the problem. They changed it. Well, how did they get in there? How did they get to be what they are to be able to change it? Guess what? The 
the Constitution. The con I don't care how you cut it, how you try to divide it, I don't care what you do with it, eventually every problem still goes back to the Constitution. He said, uh, Brent, Brent has stated two or three times that the Constitution is a brief. Well, I won't argue that. It's fairly brief. Uh, um, and, uh, but let's, let's understand this. Again, and, and I've heard this argument stated different ways, that the, the Constitution is, how I've usually heard it, it's a procedural manual, and it doesn't, there's nothing moral or immoral regarding the Constitution. Listen, there are no vacuums anywhere in life, anywhere in life. Um, there are, excuse me, no moral vacuums anywhere in life, including the Constitution. Procedural man, manual or not, you need to go, not me, not Brent, you need to go through the Constitution with this book in your hand, with Psalms 19, 7 through 11, that he read to you from his translation, in mind. And you need to examine the Constitution itself by the only ethical standard by which everything has to be examined, and that's Yahweh, God's morality, as reflected in His commandments, statutes, and judgments. Examine it by that document, and I guarantee you there is not an article or amendment that's not biblically antithetical or seditious to our God's morality and His sovereignty. I've already shared with you some of it. I'd like to be able to share, I'd like to be able to go through every article with you and every amendment, and show you the, the contrast between what we find in that document and the results that we are living under today as compared or contrasted with what we find in the Bible. There are no more blocking. Baseball rules are not moral. There are no more. It's a procedural man. But it is not a moral vacuum. Moral vacuum because any time baseball, a baseball procedural manual, if it was written in violation of what we find in God's morality is reflected in His laws, it, it's, 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 and, and if they get going, it's still, a, 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 it's still not a vacuum. They're in alignment. As long as they stay in alignment, it may not have anything to say about the Bible. It may not, it may not refer to the Bible. But it's, it's either an immoral or moral document, whether it's in alignment with God's law or not. Yeah, it's a, the Constitution's a brief. I don't have any problem with that. But that brief must be examined by the only ethical standard, and that's God's morality, as reflected or codified in His commandments, statutes, and judgments. It says it don't, it doesn't, Brent said it, it doesn't, it, uh, let me see if I can decipher my notes here. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't tell us to do this, or it doesn't tell us not to do this. Well, I, I disagree. Article 6, we've already talked about it. Article 6, Christian, or excuse me, it says religious, but the only, the only religious test in existence at the time were the Christian tests in the state the state's constitutions. It has all to do with Christians. So that's why I say Christian. By the history, it was a Christian test ban for civil leaders. It was a ban. That's a do not do this, you cannot use the Christian test of the, of the state constitutions for the federal, federal officials. Again, have you ever wondered how we ended up with such civil leaders? That we have, quote, unquote, civil leaders. Demagogues that we have today. Is it because of the biblical qualifications of the Bible or because they were banned in Article chap, uh, in uh, Article 1? Or, excuse me, Article 6. Same article says that the Constitution is the supreme law, and therefore, if the Constitution says that, you know, no, no religious steps, and therefore, what do we end up with? Muslims, Hindus, and, and don't think that just because they are, they suddenly take an oath um, uh, that all of a sudden they uh, don't have anything, any baggage, any moral baggage, any religious baggage that doesn't come with it. Do you know that? The, for example, you know that the uh, the partial birth uh, uh, partial birth uh, abortion I call it infanticide in utero infanticide, but the the partial birth laws on the on the books today, you know where they they almost word for word 
out of the tunnel. And I, in fact, I think that's in the book here as well, if not it's in one of my other books. Almost word for word out of the tunnel, the partial birth, where they let the baby get partially born and then killed it. Right out of almost, almost word for word out of the tunnel. Now, how did that get into our Bibles? The Talmud is the antithesis of what almost everything what we find moral in the Bible. You may not know it. And that's the, that's the, the, the today's Jews book, religious book by their own testimony and confessions. The, the Talmud is nearly the exact opposite of everything you find moral in the Old Testament. And they've been allowed to bring their religion and their influence and their culture into America. Article 6, Christian Testament. How can that be done? Young says, well, it doesn't have anything to say, tell us what to do or what not to do. Well, how about Amendment 1's free exercise clause? Again, are you concerned about all the mosques throughout this country? Being built in this country? Mosques are going to take over this country if we don't wake up and realize what's being done. Well, how did they get there? Well, because Amendment 1's religious uh, excuse me, free exercise clause said they could. Does the First Amendment allow that? Or does the First Amendment allow that? I disagree with Brent completely that there's not do's and don'ts in the Constitution, and I bet money if you read the Constitution, you won't agree with it either. Because it's full of do's and don'ts, and that's why it's so easily, once we use the, the, the only um, means of evidence yes. testing anything, once we use that as a standard instead of cherry pick quotations from the founders or common law or any of these other things that they've got to resort to because you can't prove the Constitution is biblical by the Constitution. Once you use the true ethical standard of God's morality, you can do the same thing I do and, re and write your own book because it will be very evident to you that it does tell us what to do and don't. It's not as free. It nonetheless does so. Thank you very much. Greg, you have 10 minutes to rebut texting argument. Thank you, Charlie. Dead. Well, the problem is this. As I said before, it's always the same. It's men. Men are the problem. There's, not such, there's no such thing as war on terror. There's no such thing as war on poverty, as Uncle Bindi used to tell us. There's no such thing as war on non-personality. No war is on men. And if war is not on men, it's political deceit. A way to squeeze money out of it. That's what it is. War on poverty, war on terror, war on the virus. Nobody knows it really exists. On and on the madness goes. No men are the problem. And our forebears, I've mentioned a while ago, were reform. Reform. 98.6 of the best figures I can see of the people who lived in the 13 original colonies were a Puritan or Congregational English stock, Scots Irish Presbyterian stock, or German Dutch Reform stock. And what they believed was this. They believe that man is fundamentally depraved at his conception. He's tainted. They believe that there's nothing good in any individual that could ever please God. Nothing. Doesn't mean men can't do good things. You can't keep your house clean, you can't plow your ground, feed your dog. There's nothing in you, they said, that could please God. That's called total depravity. They called it total because they were in contradistinction to the Roman Church. The Roman Church said man born as blind as a blank slate. He can go one way or the other. They said, no, the Bible doesn't see it say that. The Bible says, as I mentioned a while ago, this is negative doctrine, our doctrine. But if you can't accept it, then you don't see any of the say it does the point. That's what Paul the Apostles also in Romans and Galatians. Well, Men are not the answer. The only thing, if you get rid of the Constitution, the only thing you've got left is men. That's all you got left. I'm not going to go down over you. The only thing you got left is you and me. Who was it said? Famous quote. Power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolute. That's not true. Power never corrupted anybody. Now, I'm with the fellow that founded the country, our first founders. I'm with them. Men are corrupt. 
who their father is. And their fathers are corrupt because of who their father was. fathers are. Going right back to our old Grandpa Adam and Grandma Eve. Corrupt. That's what the Bible teaches. And it doesn't teach it in an ambiguous way. It states it for right now. All over and over. We're the problem. So what is the remedy to our problem? The remedy to our problem is process. That's what Jesus Christ said. When he talked about how you deal with the problem between you and your neighbor, you and your brother, or you and your sister, Matthew chapter 18, we're talking about corruption between men. Why do men have problems? Because they're corrupt. Read James, will tell you all about it. How do you handle those problems? Jesus Christ gives us a process there. He doesn't give us a List of laws, are they just a law important? Yes, but the process is the only way to reach the den. The end result, some people would say damn, the tribe of damn is named after that word. Translated judgment means final judgment. The only way you can deal with that is process. You go to court, you got a judge that's gone mad. You didn't care about the law, it seems to be common sometimes, some places. What do you do? You demand process. You say, wait a minute, I have a right to be heard. I have a right to notice a process. The Bible says that in Proverbs. The Constitution of the United States says it in many places. Listen, we can talk about all the details of the Constitution, but if these three points, these three points I mentioned earlier, if Ted's right, then what he says about the Constitution is right, and all the details are one place. If I'm right, not me, but if the law is right. This is not about men, this is about law. We are a nation. Our founders, our first founders said we are a nation of laws, not of men. Changing men in office isn't going to change anything. They're going to, oh, good way, I said power, and that was Lord Dalbert Emory acted. He was a staunch Romanist. That's why he said power corrupts. He believed that man was born as a blank slate. He knew a lot about his religion. He was wrong. Well, power will excite the taint of corruption that's in it. Oh, yeah. That's why you see politicians and judges go to office and then they turned out not to be the man you thought they were. <laughs> I used to wonder what caused that. I realize now that power doesn't corrupt. It excites the taint of imperfection in every person. It will. Money can do the same thing. Well, false law or false god. We the people is not a false god. God has delegated. God has delegated jurisdiction to men. Follow process. That's our job. We the people, the militia of the several states of the United States, God delegated two duties to them. The militia has two duties. We the people. People back then, they say, back at the time the Constitution was ratified, who are the people? The militia. Who are the militia? The people. That's easy. Of course, the Bible says the same thing. That's probably why in our English-speaking world, the Bible has been so powerful, like no other among the other people, that it came to that conclusion. It's not a false God. We've been delegated jurisdiction to govern. Who would argue otherwise? We the people. We're the ones that say we observe that this is true and we should follow this process. If we find the process is wrong, we find, as our common law courts traditionally have said, well then, the process will enable, will enable, if we follow it, enable the truth to pop forth from the flux of human relationships. Confrontation of witnesses. Whoa, whoa, there's a process. The right, the Constitution, it didn't make this stuff, but those fellows that drafted the Constitution did not make that up all the law. No, that's just the way things were. Every state was that way. We are a common law country with the exception of one jurisdiction. Louisiana. <laughs> Louisiana is a Roman jurisdiction founded by Frenchmen from Quebec. And by the way, the other jurisdiction in North America that is the law of the city instead of the law of the land is Quebec. We went to war with Britain because of the Quebec Act, which extended the boundary of Quebec from the north of the Parliament of this, from north of the Great Lakes to the Ohio River. That took in all of the territory that the Crown had deeded over to the colony of Virginia. And they said we're not going to stand for it. 
that's one of the great reasons why we went for it. Because they said, you have put a foreign law in a neighboring province. And you have extended that jurisdiction into these colonies down to the Ohio River. We went to war. Our Declaration of 76 says that. But it all came down to the law of the land versus the law of the city. And the Bible, together, together with the laws of nature unwritten in the nature of things, the Declaration of 76 says that. The laws of nature, unwritten in the nature of things, and the laws of nature stop. That is the common law. We call it common law today. And the laws of nature's God is the law of Britain. That's the Bible. That's what those two phrases meant. That's what those two phrases mean today. It's been forgotten. John Locke confirmed that's what they mean. And it was from the Scottish Enlightenment that those phrases arose. I'm a word man. I try to be a word man. This just comes down to words. That's what it comes down to. What do the words mean? And you'll get the answers in most every case that I discover. Well, false God, we the people, false law, the Constitution, no, that's not a false law, it's not fundamental. The observations may be wrong, but if they're wrong, then the Constitution of the United States had a machinery in place, process, that allows that to be remedied. That's an admission that's not perfect, it's the observations of men. And the supremacy clause. The supremacy clause is not a superlative, it's a superior. It's a superior. Compared to what? It's limited by the words, words of limitation. The supreme law of the land. That's words of limitation, not words of purchase. It doesn't grab anything. It limits. That is not superlative. Thank you very much. Guys, we have five minutes to rebut Brett's rebuttal. Okay, uh, I think everyone here probably recognizes that the United States Constitution, excuse me, the United States Constitutional Republic is often described as a government of, by, and for the people. Abraham Lincoln had used it in his, I believe, his Gettysburg Address, if not that, then another one. And uh, I hope that you recall the, the former uh, overhead that I had up from New Haven, uh, Connecticut's Constitution or Agreement. And that um, it very clearly a government, it, or they established, uh, they did very clearly they did not establish a government of by and for the people based upon man-made laws. I mean, you, should, I, you read it, you should be able to conclude the very same thing. I mean, it very clearly stated that their government was based upon God's word, God's law, Christ the Savior. In fact. The, doc, the, the, uh, the quote I did not read to you from Alexis de Tocqueville in his Democracy from America, he says about that very same document, he says the document begins with, Thou shalt have no other gods but the Lord. And followed, he says, by the death penalty for those who break it. I would ask you to think about 1600 America. Were there mosques in 1600 America? Were there synagogues? Were there temples to the Hindu god or any other god in 1600 America? Are there mosques today in the Constitutional Republic, also known as a government of, by, and for the people? Are there synagogues dotting the land? Are there temples to gods not Yahweh dotting the land? I asked you. Obviously, the answer to the last question is yes, they're all over the place. And the answer to the former question concerning the early 1600s is no, there were none. <laughs> they weren't about to try to come in here and build uh, mosques and synagogues and, and uh, temples to look to other gods when the Constitution of New Haven, Connecticut begins with the First Commandment and its death penalty. So I ask you, um, is the documents, is the documents, a problem, or the, are the, are the, is there a document that created a problem, created by men who created the document, of course? And is there another document that kept or eliminated the very same problems under the document we live under today? You know, that should be really clear that there's there's a big difference. You know, but I don't know if I mentioned this already, but but uh, what they created. In the early 1600s, when you go back to our true biblical uh, foundations and 
groups here in America, they didn't create a, 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 a government of by and for the people. They created a government of by and for God, established expressly on His law. I mean, they made it crystal clear. This is the law, beginning with the First Amendment and its judgment. There was no question, and there's no question for any of us sitting here that there's something drastically, biblically different between the two documents. That should be so easy to see without even having to go through every article and every amendment line by line like I have. Um, again, I want you to, if, if, if you want this book, I want you to have it. There's also, if you'd rather read the 85, in fact, I'm going to make this available at the end of the end of the, uh, the debate for any all families here, a uh, copy of the primer, which is an 85, we reduced it down to an 85-page primer, and really dealing with some of the more important aspects of the Constitution. This is a little daunting for some people, especially in this day of no readers. So we've got the 85-page primer that we want to make sure you get when you go out. Uh, and again, the big book is yours for free. In fact, if you go to BibleVersusConstitution.org, all of my 28 books, well, excuse me, one or two does not. But almost all of my books are online on our website. I'm not in this to, to make money. You can go and download it. Everything is in, including the, this book as well. Every part of this book is found online. I challenge you, this is too important to just dismiss that, you know, it's just it's just a procedural manual. There's too much at stake. We're talking about kingship. We're talking about God's kingdom. We're talking about His word and His law. Keep that in mind as you consider what Brenda and I have to say. Thank you. We're now going to have a 15 minute intermission. 15 minute intermission. This segment is going to be approximately 45 minutes and it's going to be question and answer between uh, Ted and Brent. Ted has got some questions and he's got 22 and a half minutes to get this session completed and he's going to uh, ask Brent a question. Brent's going to respond. 22 and a half minutes. Okay, important to, um, I, I've got to thinking we, it's too bad that we didn't make overheads out of these questions because some of them are going to are kind of uh, maybe even complicated. So you're going to need to listen carefully and, and then listen, listen to the question and listen to the answers as well on both sides. We, we need, to, need to be comparing the question and what it's asking and, and the answer as well. All right, my hey, question. Hang on just one second, Ted. Guys, you notice there's two mics there. Yes, the yes. one you have in your hand is for the house and, the, and that one is for the production. So I need you to, I'm sorry, but I need you to. Yeah. Pay close attention to both of them. I better just okay. put it back. All right. okay. Yeah, I just have to get up close. Yeah. And Brent, we are live streaming, but I'm having lots of people tell me that they're hearing Ted, but they're having trouble hearing do, you. Ask him, Brent, why don't you do it? Let's do a test and see if this we fixed it. All right, Brent is going to do a test for you, uh, for those on live stream. And somebody let me know if he sounds any better. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He can count. <laughs> All right. I can too. <laughs> it's a draw. <laughs> yeah, it's a draw. I passed first grade. <laughs> <laughs> That's about all I passed. But. All, right. <laughs> all right, we ready to go? Ready. All right, question number one, Brent. Um, according to Isaiah 33, 22 and James 4, 12, which is for Yahweh is our lawgiver, Isaiah 33, 22. Yeah, there is one lawgiver, James 4, 12. According to those two passages, do you believe that Yahweh, God of the Bible, or however you want to name him, is the only lawgiver, and that as such, any law contrary to his law is biblically seditious? And the answer is no, he's not the only lawgiver. How do I know? Because Jesus Christ said so. He said to the Pharisees, the Judiacs, he said, do you not know that I have said in your law, now I'm not quoting that just the way it is, but that's what it means, I have said in your law. <laughs> Powerful statement. I said, ye, plural, ye are gods. What do you mean? Quoting Psalm 
82. Ye are gods. In Psalm 82, what he quoted there, the word is Elohim. Elohim. What does Elohim mean? Translated gods. God in the singular, El. The New Testament, Theos. Those two words mean the same thing, have always mean the same, meant the same thing. They mean lawgiver. Law giver. What's a lawgiver? Anciently, that's what it's always meant. Why don't we translate it that way? Well, there's a reason behind that, too, because, because our forebears had warlocks that cast evil spells, and when they got the Bible, they said, this is a good spell. They called it the gospel. And there is none good but God, said Jesus Christ, so they said, we'll identify this new God as the good one. And it's been shortened to God. But it means lawgiver. And Jesus Christ said, you are lawgivers. Why did he say that? Because men on land, God has delegated authority, jurisdiction, warrant, right to men on land to be final arbiters of right and wrong in individual instances from whose decision there is no meaningful appeal. That's a definition of a lawgiver. Final decider of right and wrong in individual instances from whose decision there is no appeal. That's the true God. There is no appeal from the true maker of heaven and earth. But he's not the only lawgiver. The psalmist says that the people of God, the militia, the ha'am, to them is delegated jury duty. Yeah. And in our common law tradition, that's what it is. You know, the jury that Jesus Christ impaneled to witness, to witness the evidence of his messiahship and his identity. He just grabbed 12 men standing around. That's what we do at common law. We, dra- we grab 12 men standing around. And we ask them who lives and who dies and who wins and who loses. That's the common law tradition. The rest of the world thinks we're crazy, but it served us well. Why? Because, well, because God likes it. God, the true lawgiver. But yes, we are delegated here on land. On land, we, men, God has given us that duty. I'm not sure how long I have. Two minutes? Help me with that. Oh, I've got 30 seconds left? Oh, okay. Well, so there's not only one true lawgiver. As a matter of fact, James 4.12 doesn't say that there's only one lawgiver. It says there is one lawgiver. Echad in the Hebrew, referring to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Question 2. I don't, I don't get a chance to respond, is that correct, to that? You do get a chance to respond or go on to question 2. Okay. Uh, I agree that the Bible does talk about other lawgivers other than the one described in Isaiah 33, 22 and James 4, 12. But in er- invariably, it's talking about those who are lawgivers who are legalizing what God, either God has made unlawful or making legal what he has, um, excuse me, making legal what he has, he, God has declared unlawful or vice versa. Um, and here's an example, uh, chapter 15 of Matthew, Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, it says, and then Jesus, uh, and then came Je- to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders, which was later codified about circa 500 AD into what we know today as the Babylonian Talmud. He said, why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? The Pharisees speaking to, I'm sorry? Oh, anyway, read this and you'll see that, yeah, there were lawgivers, but they were, they were unlawful lawgivers. There's only one lawgiver and anyone who is in violation of that one lawgiver, you know, is not in harmony with him. Question is, where are the framers? Question number two. Question number two. If your answer to the previous question, no, oh, you said no. You surprised me by saying that. Um, but I can, answer, I can ask this question anyway. Um, with your answer as it was, wouldn't this, well, maybe I can't. Uh, let me see if I can rephrase this. Um, you didn't answer yes. But uh, Article 1, being that there is one supreme lawgiver, I think you would agree with that, Brent, uh, wouldn't that in turn mean that Article 1, which established the legislative branch, without so much as a nod to the lawmaker's law, 
be an act of sedition against the lawmaker? No, because the legislative branch does not constitute lawgiver. A lawgiver is a final arbiter of right and wrong, a final decider of right and wrong in individual instances. That means individual cases from whose decision there is no appeal. Finally, in the common law tradition, that belongs to the jury. They are the final decider. Read the Constitution. It says that. It says any fact established by the jury shall not be, well, what it really means is shall not be challenged in any other place. The jury is final. The jury is the finder of fact and has the power to judge the law too. That's part of our common law tradition. There's no question about that. Our courts have observed that the jury has that power. The jury has basis from God. From whence did it come? I've looked. I've read books on the jury. You know, the origin of the jury in our common law tradition is lost. Lost in the fog of antiquity. Going back to those tribes to the north of Europe, the Celts, the Jutes, that's the Danes. The angels, the Saxons, fundamentally. And then from there, there's a long hiatus in history until we get back to ancient Israel. That's true. And the number 12, obviously, is an important number in the Bible. 12 tribes, 12 stones, 12 jurors. When you see the number 12, it always has to do with government. And the duty of the juror, remember, there's only two fundamental duties of government, and the militia have them both. Defense of the land, armed defense of the land, and defense of the law of the land as jurors. That's why the traditional oath we take to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Foreign, that means armed defense of the militia. Domestic, that means your defense of the law of the land, being willing to serve on the jury. Well, to defend the law of the land is to defend the land. There will be no land if the law of the land is not defended. Uh, do, do please recall that uh, Brent had made the point a couple times that man is the problem. Um, if I'm not mistaken, juries are made up of men and women of uh, uh, both. Um, I will challenge you to go through this Bible stem to stern to find anywhere where juries of the, of the populace, the general populace, is anywhere found in the scriptures promoted, validated, or even mentioned. You'll find that I deal with, with that in our, uh, chapter 6 of this book, dealing with the judicial branch. There's a section dealing with the whole idea of juries. It is another instance where the Constitution is antagonistic to what the Bible teaches. You'll find judges. You'll find judges, but you won't find juries. And the idea of... Uh, well, I'm not going to come up with it. My time's out probably anyway. You but, can take as much time as you need. You've got 22 and a half minutes to ask questions. No, I was responding it to, to that. You've got okay, well, okay, I'll, I'll move on then. Uh, we're going to skip question three because we already dealt with that. Question number four, uh, what law is supreme to you? I think I know what the answer is going to be, but uh, go ahead. Supreme is a comparative term. It's not a superlative. The supreme law of the land, Article 6, is a comparative, not a superlative. If something's comparative, it's compared to something else, but the superlative is beyond comparison. For instance, in the Older Testament, there is the phrase, the phrase that is of the same construction, King of Kings, same construction, Lord of Lords, same construction, Holy of Holies. That's the Semitic super, uh, superlative. That means it can't be compared to anything else. And when you see the word supreme law, the, the phrase supreme law of the land in the Constitution of the United States, Article 6, you're looking at a comparative, not a superlative. It's limited. Superlative is not limited. When it says supreme, then it says law of the land. What is the law of the land? That's our common law. Another name for our common law is due process. Our common law is a law of process, not of result. Listen, all of the world is under the law of the city. Almost all, well, all of it except the common law countries. And even there we have problems, of course. Encroachments, constant, never stop. But the law of the land, our common law, is process-oriented. We, we don't concentrate on the result. I tell my clients, I'm not in charge of the result. 
I'm here to make sure the process is followed. If you don't have me, it probably won't be followed as well. We follow the process, and the result then is reliable. Common lawyers say, yet today, all over, well, in the countries where there is common law jurisdiction, good process, reliable result. No good process, not a reliable result. That's what God said. That's what Jesus Christ said. It's all about process. Due process, or Constitution of the United States calls it, no man's life, liberty, or property shall be taken. I'll just move on to another question. Uh, question number seven. Without appealing to any outside source, including Antichrist Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence or the severely compromised state constitutions, how do you account for an allegedly biblically compatible document written by allegedly Christian men being devoid of any references of God, Christ, the Bible, and the Bible's laws? The same way I account for the Bible being written by sinful men. I was in New Hampshire not a couple of years ago, ran into a fellow making a presentation. He was an Oriental. He came to me. He was raised in the United States by Southern Baptist parents who had taken him on as an orphan. He said he was excited about what I say, and I don't know how it came up in the conversation, but he finally said, he said the men that wrote the Bible were without sin. I said, where in the world did you get that? Well, come to find out, he was an Islamicist. He'd had a little problem with marijuana when he was a kid. He got thrown in prison, and he got converted to Islam. Islam believes that if, you, if you're a prophet of God, you can't have sin. Muhammad didn't have sin. Jesus Christ is the second greatest prophet of Islam. That's blasphemous. But they said he didn't have sin either. They got that right. But listen, the Bible says that the men that wrote the Bible were men of like passions to us. That's a mild translation. They were men of like passions to us. Think about your passions. There's a whole lot of them. The lust of the flesh. They were like us. But... Of course, Jesus Christ had that too, but he never yielded, the Bible says. You don't have to have perfect men to write good things. Magna Carta, read about the men that wrote Magna Carta, the chief drafter of Magna Carta, a common law, solid stepping stone in the history of our common law. Magna Carta, written by the man who gave us our chapter divisions to the Bible, Stephen Langton. Stephen Langton, he wasn't perfect either. Neither were de Burr and the other men that helped him draft Magna Carta. Christian men, God's men, are not sinless men. It's no argument to say, well, they're not as good. How good do you have to be? How good do you have to be, to be for God to use you? I'll uh, just move on to question number eight. As a Christian, would you... I'll, I'll let you turn there if you need to. Question number eight. As a Christian, would you have written the Constitution in the same godless, Christless, biblically lawless fashion that is... That is, with no more than an alleged nod to Christ as its timekeeper. Well, I, that assumes facts, not in evidence. He's assuming it's like, when did you stop beating your wife? He says here, in the question, he asks if, if uh, I would write it the same way they did with no more than an alleged nod to Christ as timekeeper. I don't agree with that statement. But I'll respond to the question. The jurat of our Constitution, the jurat... That's where it says, in the year of our Lord, things like that. People say, well, that's just window dressing. No, you don't make, I don't care whether you think it's window dressing or not. When men say things like that, if they don't mean it, they'd better mean it because God's going to hold them to it. Because every time you swear to something, every time you promise, and you're sworn to put it in the passive like the Bible does, every time you do that, the Bible says God's going to hold you to it. It's nothing to say, it's nothing, it's no argument to say that, that uh, God is not mentioned explicitly. It's mentioned explicitly, he's mentioned explicitly. The book of Esther in the Bible never mentions God. Never. Does that mean it's not part of the Bible? No. Contracts that Christian men write to memorialize their agreements may not mention God at all. I've done that. Does that mean that I won't be held to my word? No, no, no. It uh, has legal significance and legal authority and legal power. If God said it, if God used sinful men, he did. did. Only God can make a straight lick with a crooked stick. And the men that wrote the Bible were crooked sticks, just like God used Mary. He made a straight lick 
with a crooked stick. And he did it with the, the men that wrote the Bible as well. Would I write it that way? That calls for speculation. I don't know what I would have done at that time. I wasn't there. But what I understand about it is this. There were a lot of Christian sects in America, and they were at each other's throats, like most Christian men are today. Uh, question number 10. We'll go to that. Do you consider the USSR's constitution biblically based and or Christian because of its biblically compatible statements? No. And here's why. Because it's a country under the code of Justinian. All communist countries are under the code of Justinian, the law of the Roman Empire in its most elevated expression, the code of Justinian of the 6th century. The code of the 600s. The code of Justinian. The code of Justinian governs every country in the world almost in its various forms, the German form, the French form, the Code Napoleon, the Code of Bismarck, or the Roman Church form, the Canon Law of the Church of Rome is the Code of Justinian in its ecclesiastic form. In every one of those instances under that old Babylonian law, and that's what the Roman law is, there are a lot of things there that are like, like what we have, do not murder your neighbor. But underneath it all, underneath it all, who's the, the final arbiter of right and wrong? Who's the, from whose decision there is absolutely no appeal. Who is it? It's the state. The state. Like Hegel said, the German, the German philosopher, the state is God walking on earth. Karl Marx said the same thing. The Code of Justinian said the same thing because the Roman emperor is deified. He's deified. And therefore, I wouldn't support it even if it said the right things. However, I do notice that Paul the Apostle in the book of Acts often used the Roman law. That was before the Code of Justinian, but the same principles. If he thought he could use it to confuse the enemy and benefit himself, he did. Oh, they had some good process in there, but again, the foundation, the foundation of all false law is a false god. And all governments are based upon law, and all law is the will of the sovereign, and the will of the sovereign we in our English Anglo word, world, we have come to call such a person a god. Well, I'm pleased to hear that, that uh, at least as I understand Brent's a, uh, answer to the question, that he obviously then agrees that biblically compatible statements in a nation's constitution does not make it biblical. And that's a, that's a common argument. They'll, yeah, like I said, you can, you can go online and you can find a you can find many lists of biblically compatible statements that have been pulled from the Constitution um, with scriptures accompanying those, and uh, they supposedly then prove that the United States Constitution is biblically compatible. Don't, do not fall for that based upon what Brent just said. All right, so I'm going to go on to uh, question number 11. If you don't consider the US, USSR's constitution biblically based because of some of its random biblically compatible statements, why would you consider the US constitution biblically based because of some of its, I, and obviously that's the wrong question. You've already answered that. Let's go to number 12. Do you believe the Bible's qualifications for civil leaders, for example, Exodus 18:21? I'll read it. It says, thou shalt provide out of the, out of excuse me, thou shalt provide out of all of the people such as fear God, men of truth, and of course that's the God of the Bible, that fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over, over them to be rulers. Exodus 18, 21. Do you believe the Bible's qualifications for civil leaders, for example, and there's many others as well, Deuteronomy 17, there's a, you have to go several places to find all the qualifications for civil leaders. But do you believe the Bible qualifications for civil leaders, regardless of where they're, they're found, are mandatory or optional? Well, they're mandatory, mandatory. And I want to add that John Wycliffe, the first man to translate the entire Bible into English, into the Anglo tongue of Mercian, the first man to ever do that, he did it from the Latin Vulgate, he didn't do it from the original Greek and Hebrew manuscripts, didn't have them, but he did it. And in the flyleaf of his copy of that Bible, there were no printing presses in those days, it had to be copied out in the flyleaf. Fly Reputedly, it said that this Bible translation was made that the government of the people, by the people, 
and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Now, Deuteronomy 17 says the same thing. If you're going to have leaders among you, they, may, they must be of you. That's the ablative. That means from you. They must be one of you. Our Constitution of the United States says the same thing about the President of the United States. He must be a what? Natural born citizen. What's a natural born citizen? He's a fellow that was born on the territorial ground of one of the states or territories or property of the United States. And second, both of his parents had to be, had to be citizens of the United States at the time of his birth. DJ, DJ Trump. His mother was born on the Isle of Lewis, off of Scotland. His father was born here, and he was born here. But his mother was a United States citizen at the time of his birth. Why? Because there's something, something about land. Our country is not the people. Patriotism is not love of the people of America, or even the government. Patriotism is love of the land. The land is everything. God has given us a land, the land the Lord your God has given you here. And we call it the law of the land because traditionally among all people, the law arises out of the land. Even the aborigines of Australia say the law arises out of the land. They got that much right. Taoism of China, they say the law arises out of the land. It comes from the sky. Time thy kingdom up. come, thy will be done on land. Ted, you're out of here. Okay. And a half minutes. I'm going to give you a, a one minute to respond. Can I, can I, can I, can I, your call, can I say Charlie. one thing here? One minute to respond. J Jim, Bob, would you go back behind my book table? There's two briefcases. Bring them up. I've left some of my notes. Okay. All right. Are you done? Yeah, I just need to get okay. those notes. All right. Brent now has 22 and a half minutes to ask 10 questions. When this segment is over, Randy Marshall will have the wireless microphone to go through the audience if anybody in the audience has any questions. So if you guys have any questions, start formulating them now. And then when Brent is finished, Randy will come through, just raise your hand, and Randy will bring you the microphone. All right, let's give Ted just a second here to get ready, Brent. Here we go. Go. Sorry about All that. Right. Brent, your time starts now. Thank you, Charlie. These questions could be answered with yes or no, unless you want to say a little more, but we can move through them quickly. Number one, men drafted and penned the Constitution. All right, before answering any of uh, the questions posed by Brent, I would like you to alert the audience to Brent's lines, line of questioning. The bulk of Brent's questions and what I suspect will be his conclusions from them have nothing to do with tonight's debate. That is, as to whether the Constitution is biblical, which can only be answered from the Constitution itself based upon the Bible and its laws. I understand why Brent would resort to such questions if he stays true to what he agreed to debate upon, he's left once again with one piece of evidence from the Constitution for his side of the article, article and that's Article 7's time statement. Overhead number one, if you would, please. Down in convention by the unanimous consent of the states, I guess I have it right here, present the 17th day of September in the year of our Lord. That's it. Consequently, he has no choice but to digress from what we have agreed to debate upon. This debate is not about my opinions on anything. Thus, unless a question of Brent's lends itself towards proving the Constitution is biblical, it's irrelevant. Consequently, that is my overall response to Brent's line, line of questioning and will be my answer to specific questions. Irrelevant. However, this is not to say that many of Brent's questions are unimportant and that they don't deserve an answer. Neither am I dodging these questions. I will be pleased to answer any question to which I respond to this debate irrelevant at another time, even here this evening. But I do a disservice to the topic of this debate to if, if, I, if I allow Brent's questions to distract us from the purpose of, of why we're here tonight. 
As to the irrelevance of Brent's questions, case in point, his opening question, one cannot take the oath to support and defend the Constitution and be a Christian. Neither Brent's question nor my answer can prove anything regarding the biblical compatibility of the Constitution, right. which is what we agreed to debate. Ooh. Next question. Your response or your next question. Oh, well, uh, we had uh, agreed to the order and the questions that I'm asking. And we planned this trial that way. These questions are important. Just because someone else, such as Ted, says they aren't, well, it's my job from my side in this adversarial process to ask them. And they deserve an answer. I find it of great note that he objects to the questions. But when can I start asking questions? Right now. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Men drafted and penned the Constitution. Yay or nay? Irrelevant. Men penned the Bible. Uh, do I get a chance to go on? Two minutes, to respond. Two minutes. okay. Irrelevant. Whether or not you've been bamboozled or not by, the, by, by those promoting the Constitution as biblically compatible is not what this debate is about. Rather, the biblical conclusion of this debate will determine who has been bamboozled. Time's yielded. Your response or next question? Well, I wanted to ask him another question. Absolutely. All men are sinners. Okay, well, that's not on the list. I got third questions. Third, third question is the Constitution is a despicable document. You may have gone to your previous list. No, these are the questions I had, Ted. I Remember, we, you redid you your list. Pardon? You redid your list. No. Pause it, Chris. I did. Yeah, you redid list. your list. You, sub, you, you submitted a different number of even questions in the, in the list. I think you've got the first list and not the second list. I agreed to the second list. You want me to read the question? Read the questions you have. I'll go with you. Let's keep okay, moving. Okay. Okay. Number. Are we ready? Ready. Number three. That the, the second list that you we agreed upon says the Constitution is a despicable document. Here's my answer. Irrelevant. We're not debating whether the Constitution is a despicable document, but rather whether the Constitution is biblical. And once again, the biblical conclusion of this debate will determine whether the Constitution is biblically despicable or not. Fourth question, well, I think we're You're not. Gonna have to yeah, I'm going to have to do it because I think you yeah. went to the wrong question. All right, number four point. from you is to repeal the Stop second. The clock, Chris. You guys take two minutes and let's get this worked out. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's going to be resolved because he doesn't. We don't have compatible lists. Well, that's all right. Let me see what you got. Maybe I can because he wants me to answer the questions. Yeah. Here's what I've got. See, this is this is the fourth question that we. And I can't take your list because you can't get that. So I don't know what to do. Well, can we can we share mics? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you we can do that. That's absolutely. good. I think Alex wants that. Wait until we, I think we got to yeah. wait to get this turned back on. So we're, this is where we're at, okay. Brent. Okay. I'm this going room? to yeah. reset Brent's time to 19 minutes. To repeal the Second Amendment would repeal our right to bear arms. Irrelevant. This is, re this is really putting the cart before the horse. What needs to be repealed in the Constitution can only be determined after a biblical conclusion has been drawn as to whether the Constitution is biblically compatible. Did God not create all men in equal dignity? Irrelevant. Brent, you need to ask God that question, not me. Furthermore, neither the question nor the answer to that question proves anything regarding the biblical compatibility of the Constitution. For one to support or invoke the Constitution's First Amendment religion clauses indicates that one is brain dead. <laughs> he may have got that from me. <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess he's not in his head yet, so I guess I he did. did. I did, yeah. I did. I was figured you had to have. <laughs> um, but I, I'm, and I said, I may have said that at one time, but the qu question is nonetheless irrelevant. Whether or not someone's brain dead for invoking, promoting, or supporting the First Commandment, violating First Amendment's free exercise clause, is not what this debate is about. Rather, the biblical conclusion of this debate will determine who's brain dead and who's not. 
All laws outside the text of the Bible are unnecessary. Yes or no? <laughs> that, yes or no, you, you, you said I could answer more uh, well, completely. That depends upon their biblical compatibility. However, it remains an irrelevant question. Nevertheless, this is something that's certainly worthy of discussion. And if, we're, if, if you're interested, um, and if you're interested, one I address in a, another book of mine called A Biblical Constitution, A Scriptural Replacement for Secular Government. One thing is for absolute certain, any constitution or law that violates the Bible's triune and integral moral law, the Ten Commandments and their respective statutes and judgments, is unequivocally incompatible with the Bible. Case in point, the constitution in which there's hardly an article or amendment that's not adverse or seditious to Yahweh's sovereignty and morality. A practicing homosexual is not entitled to respect Irrelevant. That's something for God's law to determine, such as Leviticus 18.22 and 2013. This debate is not about sodomites and lesbians, but rather the biblical compatibility of the Constitution. However, let's reframe the question to make the subject relevant. Rephrase, does the Constitution have anything to do with today's in-your-face homosexual transgender quote-unquote drag queen movement? My answer, absolutely. And if you believe the prophet Hosea, you should believe the same. But before going to Hosea, here's a question. Could today's sodomite, lesbian, and quote-unquote transgender movement have existed in early 1600s America, whose governments of, by, and for God were expressly established upon the moral laws of God, including Leviticus 18.22 and 2013 and Deuteronomy 22.5? Well, the answer is, of course not. Consequently, there must be a definitive moment in America's history when her Christian character and biblical course were officially altered. That point was in 1787 when a cadre of Enlightenment and Masonic theistic rationalists, also known as the Constitutional Framers, replaced the early 1600 governments for their own humanistic government of, by, and for the people based upon capricious man-made traditions, also known as the biblically seditious constitution. As for today's homosexual, transgender movement, and hundreds of thousands of other consequences, they are the consequences of the whirlwind today's America is reaping thanks to the wind sown by the constitutional framers. Overhead number two, please. Hosea chapter 8, verses 1 and 7. Because they have trespassed against my law, they have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. In other words, today's America is reaping the inevitable, ever-intensifying whirlwind, including today's homosexual, transgender movements, only to get, result, re, re, uh, get worse, resulting from the wind sown by the constitutional framers when they replace the Bible's immutable moral law. The, constitu the Constitution is the reason that America has corporate bureaucracies, a central bank, and standing armies. Irrelevant. But could today's corporate bureaucracies, central bank, and her standing armies be but more of the hundreds of thousands of consequences of the whirlwind today's America is suffering because of the wind sown by the constitutional framers? I get a response, Charlie? I yes, forgot. Yes. Real quick. Uh, the Constitution of the United States does not authorize corporate bureaucracies. That is unconstitutional. FDR put them in place. There's no question. It's not like it's a matter of ambiguity. Next question. Next question. Psalm 19 is foundational to your rejection, to your rejection of the Constitution. First, I'd like you to note that uh, he confirmed what I just said about the whirlwind effect of bureaucracies. They are, they're not the wind. They're, a, they're the whirlwind, part of the whirlwind. All right, back to his question. The Constitution is the reason that America, w excuse me, Psalms 19 is foundation to, foundational to your rejection of the Constitution. Thank you. This question is relevant in tonight's debate. Overhead number three. Psalms 19, 7 through 11, the law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise and simple. The statutes of Yahweh are true, righteous, and you can read the rest of it on your own. This is but one of the many passages. Deuteronomy 4, 5, and 8. Deuteronomy 28. Psalms 119 in its entirety. Romans 3, 31, etc. That dictate that Yahweh, dictate Yahweh is sovereign and thus his moral law is supreme. There can only be one supreme law, the Constitution per Article 6, or Yahweh's moral law per the Bible. Choose carefully. 
Because once again, idolatry is not so much about statues as it is statutes such as what one considers the supreme law of the land. To attempt to meld the two is to be as double-minded as the Israelites again with Mount, on Mount Carmel with Elijah. Why halt you between two opinions? Psalm 19 divided in two parts. The first seven verses, the first six verses bespeak the, what we call today our common law. And the second, verse, uh, the second half of the psalm is dropped into that context. All the terms in the first six, six verses of Psalm 19, all of the Hebrew terms are literary terms, although it's talking about astronomical subject. All of the terms in the second half of Psalm 19 are astronomical terms, though it's talking about the literature called the Bible. It's a beautiful psalm, but both of those, the laws of nature unwritten in the nature of things, Psalm 1 through 6, and the laws of nature's God written in the Bible, both of those are mutually supportive, mutually supportive, and the one supports the other. That's why Paul starts in Romans chapter 1, he says, all men know because they look. He's quoting Psalm 19. That's why the famous hymn that says, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder and consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I, hear, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed, and then the next verses flow into the written word of God. Next question. The United States has not been a Christian nation, nation since 1789. Is that true? First, I would like to comment on Psalms 19. Um, that provides the first verses do not provide anything common law as we would know it and understand it today and instead provides the credentials of Yahweh as the creator of the universe to then establish his law as supreme. The United States has not been a Christian nation since 1789 is the question irrelevant. Tonight's debate is not about when America was or was not a Christian nation but rather about the biblical compatibility of the Constitution. However, because many like to quote Supreme Court Associate Justice David J. Buer in his opinion in Holy Trinity versus versus the United States regarding the United States of America, also known as the Constitutional Republic, being allegedly a Christian nation, let's briefly discuss it. Overhead number four. Okay, I'm not gonna do that, it's too long. Um, but uh, here's a question for y'all. Can a nation whose government is based upon violations of the first commandment, along with violations of many other commandments and statutes be considered Christian? Or does Justice Brewer's decision when not cherry-picked, instead reveal he was very much the same as the other Masonic and Enlightenment theistic rationalists of the day who promoted religious pluralism. That's Masonry and Mormonism, that's, that's part of their makeup. National, what I would call national polythe polytheism in total disregard of the First Commandment. Stop the clock, Chris. Ted, you have two minutes to respond to Brent's question. I did. I, I understand that. But in that one, you, you started your response by continuing answering the previous question. So Probably. Just, just stop that one and, and go on to the next one. Okay. I'm not sure what you're saying. You, you, when you began to answer his next yeah. question, you continued answering the previous question. No, then I asked, it, I asked the question he asked, and then I just answered it. Okay. I did add, I did add that question. Okay. All right. We're, we're back on the clock. Yep. An oath to the Constitution is identical to an oath of Muhammad. Should have said to Muhammad, I think. That's okay. But I'll, you, you I'll, I'll excuse you for that one. <laughs> Irrelevant. <laughs> We're not here tonight to discuss any similarity there may be between oaths, period, but rather the biblical compatibility of the Constitution itself. That said, Mohammed was a finite man. The constitutional framers were finite men. I think we can all agree upon that much. Therefore, any law or constitution created by either Muhammad or any other man or group of men, such as the constitutional framers, that conflicts with the Bible's triune moral law is not a biblically compatible document. This wouldn't make oaths to them identical, but it would sure make them similar in that both would be oaths to capricious man-made constitutions rather than to God, his word, and his moral law. These questions, every one of them I'm asking Ted, 
I know the answer to. I know what his, his I know what his answer would be if he would answer the questions, because I'm not doing anything fancy or lawyerly. I just took them from his presentations, his oral presentations. These are statements he has made, and I'm asking him if they're true. All it amounts to. The Constitution's Second Amendment is the cause of the current increase of gun legislation in the United States. Like I said, um, I don't have any problem with the questions, but, they're, but we do need to recognize that they do not pertain to what we agreed to debate upon at least most of them. The question again, the Constitution's Second Amendment is the cause of the current increase of gun legislation in the United States. Irrelevant. However, if this is true, it would be one, uh, it would be but another instance of another consequence of the whirlwind today's America is reaping thanks to the wind sown by the constitutional framers. In this instance, resulting from replacing non-optional biblical responsibilities such as found in Psalms 145, 6 through 9, and 1 Timothy 5, 8, for the latter of which says we're worse than an infidel if we don't provide for our family and provision for our family begins with spiritual and physical protection. It's non-optional. Whereas under the Second Amendment, it's, it's, it's optional. I don't have to wear, I don't have to protect my family if I don't want to under the Second Amendment. In this instance, it's resulting from the non-optional biblical responsibility or being replaced with optional enlightenment rights. It's an important question, but it's just not relevant. Friends, neighbors, and kin. <laughs> Friends, neighbors, and kin. The character of men, he says, matters. He wants to talk about the fellows that drafted the Constitution and what their religious beliefs were. I'm exploring the character of Ted. He's a witness. That's called exploring credibility. I ask questions. I want you to know who he is. I want to know who he is. Because that bears upon, listen, bias. It's not always bad. Everybody's got it. Everybody leans a little more one direction than another on most things. And we don't understand why. But bias at common law is always relevant. And to explore the beliefs of another fella. He's talking about these fellas being Masons and all. Well, I want to know what Ted believes. A lot of things that Ted believed that I don't believe. Is that relevant? Let's go to the next question. Yeah, to support the Constitution is to be an idolater, correct? Again, I don't have any problems with any of these questions. They're all pertinent. They're just not pertinent as it pertains to what we're here to discuss. This question is relevant. At least to a point. To answer this question, we must first understand what idolatry is. Once again, idolatry is not so much about statues as it is statutes such as what one considers the supreme law of the land. If the supreme law, of law, if the supreme law conflicts with God's supreme law, then absolutely supporting the opposing supreme law would be an instance of idolatry. Case in point, Iran's supreme law. No Christian today would hesitate to identify Iran's supreme law as an instance of idolatry. Why? Because it's antithetical and or seditious to the Bible's supreme law. So let's be consistent and apply the same rule for idolatry to any nation's constitution that's antithetical and or seditious to the Bible's supreme law. If that is in fact what the U.S. Constitution is, and as a Christian, you refuse to apply the same rule to the U.S. Constitution as you would to Iran's Constitution, you only help to prove the point that idols die hard. The oldest known root in the English language, the oldest known root is the word vid. Vid. It's from the Sanskrit. They said vid. We have the word video. That means what you can see. Vid. The word idolone is that same root. Idolone translated idol in the Newer Testament, the Newer Testimony. An idol is something you can see. It's something fashioned with the hands of men. It can be any created thing, but it cannot be a document. Let's be precise about the Bible. Writings that are of false religion are bad. The Bible makes that point, but the Constitution of the United States is not, cannot be, an idol. Let's be precise with the Bible. Next question. The Bible records that the nation of Israel was lawless during most of its national history. 
I think I said enough about uh, idols and what constitutes idolatry, and I'll let you decide whether the Constitution is therefore uh, has been made an idol or not. I'll guarantee you this. Take it on, and you'll find how much of an idol it really is. All right, back to his question. The Bible records that the nation of Israel was lawless during, the, during most of its national history. True, but nonetheless irrelevant. I often hear it argued that the Israelites failed to keep God's law as if that justifies the founding fathers' failure to do the same. I hear that's the argument I hear all the time. If that's not a head scratcher, I don't know what is. And only goes to once again prove idols die hard. And how far some people will go to protect their idol. Come on, folks. The Israelites' failures do not justify us failing to justify or do, do not do not justify us failing or justify us following the failure of the constitutional framers in following God, his word, and his law. The Israelites had the written revelation of God, the tamim, and Jesus Christ rejected them because through the centuries, the Older Testament, 70% of the Bible is a narrative of the unfaithfulness of God's people. That's what it is. Men don't write books like that. God writes books like that. The New Haven, Connecticut Puritan Colony established itself, under, established itself in 1639 under biblical law. Irrelevant. Next question. The New Haven, Connecticut Puritan Colony no longer exists under biblical law. Irrelevant, but tragically true. There, is, there was, theirs was a government of, by, and for God expressly established upon his moral law and thus where America finds her true biblical roots and the reason for, then the reason per Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14 for America's former greatness. Now, replaced with a humanistic government of, by, and for the people based upon capricious man-made traditions, an experiment that not only has failed but was destined to fail from its very inception as are all humanistic governments. And for anyone... Who, who might respond, yeah, but the early 1600 governments of by and God failed as well. No, they did not fail. Quite the opposite. The failure was in the Americans failing to remain true to Yahweh as, as sovereign and thus his moral law is supreme. And had they remained true, America would, would have remained great, blessed instead of cursed as today, per Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68. The Constitution and its republic is often depicted as the grand experiment in self-government. Self-government? Gee, what could go wrong? Everything. Just look around you where we're at today. Folks, don't you think that 237 years of failed experiment has been long enough? Time to get back to what, was init what initially made America great and the only thing that can make America great again. If not for ourselves, than for the sake of our posterity. <clears throat> Paul the Apostle said that men twist the scriptures, speaking of the Bible, oh, I'm sorry. to their own destruction, no less the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution is an Antichrist document, correct? Brad, your time is up. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody you. in the I audience you have any questions? Can we sit down for this? Absolutely. Oh, well, but, we got the mics. But, yeah, you, no, you can sit down because it, it might be a question for Ted. It might be a question for Brent. And I'm going to do my very best to keep score to make sure that the questions are even. Okay? So, Randy, if the first question is for Ted, then let's try to make the next question for Brent. Okay? All right. When the question is asked, please take the microphone. Okay, please stand up. Take Ted's microphone. Well, All right, go to, go to Ted's microphone. No, I understand, but we'll, we'll use Ted's. We need to use Ted's. On, on the live stream, they're all telling me that Ted's microphone is much better than Brent's. Okay, all right. Randy, question, we have 20 minutes. Hi, my name is Joe Love, and uh, Brent, this question's for you. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. Uh, it's only about the maybe the second time I've had interaction or seen you, so I think you are incredible. Uh, thank you for being here. It's like you're a man out of time. I'd love to watch you all day. It's like watching an old Western movie. And I, just, I love your character, too, so I'm just really appreciate you for being here. So my question to you is, why 
then the Constitution. Why do we need the Constitution? If the law, God's law, is good enough, why do we need the Constitution? With king or no wins, and, you know, the pennies are its tails. <coughs> did, did you hear any better? Because it's just not long. Well, I'm getting old, it's probably. <laughs> but go ahead, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm getting it ready. Okay, so why the Constitution? I haven't really seen the, direct, the driven point of your, you know, your side of this debate. You know, thumbnail, maybe. Why the Constitution, if God's laws are good enough to govern us, why do we need the Constitution? You have two minutes to respond. Because men have been given jurisdiction over the process. That's the whole point. The Constitution of the United States is a solid stepping stone in the history of our common law and the history of our tradition. A solid stepping stone is a good one. It's not perfect, no. It admits that by allowing amendments. Magna Carta is a solid stepping stone. The laws of Edward the Confessor before that, or after Magna Carta, solid stepping stone. The, all, the laws of King Alfred, solid stepping stone. The Moult Nine Laws, which I'd mentioned a while ago, another solid stepping stone. It's about process. We must have a process. God has given us that jurisdiction if we do not take it up and make those observations. William Blackstone wrote the four volumes on the common law, or the laws of England, they call them the commentaries on the common law. More copies sold in the American colonies of three million people than did in England of eight million people of that day, 17 and 65. In those volumes, he lays it out the way it is, the truth of the common law. Edward Coke did it before that in his institutes, institutes where he unpacked Magna Carta. We have to take up, we have to, we should, it behooves us, would be the Bible's way of saying it, it behooves us to take up our responsibilities as members of the militia. We have two duties as members of the militia. We're not filling them. Number one, John Wycliffe said the same thing. John Wycliffe said, I'm going to translate the Bible into English so the boy behind the plow can read. And I'm going to make sure that the common law supplants the law of the city in Oxford. If we don't do both, we're not going to rescue our country. And if we don't do both in the United States, we're not going to rescue our country. The common law is among the greatest blessings our country has ever been given. And the Constitution of the United States is a superb expression of our common law of government. I'm sorry. Would you like to answer the question? Two uh, minutes. I'll, I'll just respond very quickly. Um, just keep in mind whether we're talking Constitution, common law, and th th they're almost oftentimes mixed to be the two. The question is not all this uh, um, associated information about it. The question is, the final question is, do, does the constitu is the Constitution biblical? Is there anything? Go through the Constitution. I beg for you all to go through the Constitution yourself. You know, I find that most people have never read the Constitution. They'll argue for the Constitution. Seems to me that might qualify for idolatry. They'll, they, they, they'll, they'll, they'll contend for the Constitution, but they've never read the silly thing. I suggest you read it. I don't want you to avoid it. I want you to read it. But when you read it, you have this in your hand, and I hope you know it well enough to be able to examine it. You know, I think that as Christians, we have so desperately wanted those guys to be our guys and that document to be our document that we fail to examine it by the only ethical standard by which everything must be examined, and that's by God as sovereign and his law as supreme. Exa I want you to examine it because I am absolutely convinced you will come to the same conclusion I have. Now, you may not come to all of the same conclusions, but I think you won't get very far and you'll realize that this document is not what we have been told that it is. Call it common law or call it whatever you want. The question, is, the question we must answer, is it biblical? Does it, is it in accord with God's morality as found in his commandments, statutes, and judgments? Thank you. Next question. Uh, Brent, you said that the process is Matthew 18. However, when you enter a courtroom and you ask to face your accuser, you invariably are told the state is your accuser. But it's a corporate entity which you said there is no 
corporate recognition in the Constitution. So therefore, if the process has failed, why haven't you and your trade industry corrected the process? For the same reason that the clergy of the United States has not taught the Bible. You wouldn't find a preacher in America hardly that could recite the 66 books of the Bible in order, much less the Ten Commandments. Same reason. As I tried to stress, men are the problem. Oh, you find a good preacher once in a while, and you can find a good lawyer once in a while, too. But they are going to be few and far between in both cases. We in America are getting what we have allowed ourselves to get. When you look around you, you see the evil, the evil empire, the lawlessness, I call it lawlessness, swirling about us. And the only remedy for lawlessness, the only remedy for lawlessness, there's only one, is true law. It comes in two volumes, the laws of nature, unwritten in the nature of things, and the laws of nature is God written in the Bible. The first is process. Matthew 18 is just a good example of that principle. You know, you can't even define, our courts have observed over and over. Our Supreme Court has observed. You can't define due process. There was a movement in America to get rid of our common law back in the 1820s, 30s, into the 40s. And they couldn't do it through the federal government, so they tried to do it through the state legislatures individually, and it came down to two, three states. And each one of those almost did away with the common law by legislative vote. If it wasn't for the efforts of Henry Clay in Kentucky, Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, I think it was one vote, Missouri too. You can't get rid of the common law because it is the way things are and they will not change. Our word law is a Danish word. The Danes were the Vikings, the Jutes. And the word, they said this, they said log. They were guttural, log. And what is log? It is that which is logged, like waterlogged. It won't move. The way things are and they will not change. Okay, I think that was Doug back there asking the question if I recognize the voice, and he implied lawyers, and Brent mentioned lawyers. I would uh, suggest that the problem is uh, the answer to the question, and why that there's such a problem as described in Doug's question, is that we have no lawyers, lawyers, in America today. Haven't since the, the ratification of the Constitutional Republic. What we instead have had is legalers. Lawyers are those like Ezra in Ezra 7.10 who defend the law of God, not the Constitution, not the common law. Those are lawyers. The rest are legalers who make illegal what God has determined as lawful and make legal what God has determined as unlawful. We have legalers today in America and not lawyers, and that's why we have the problems, and I mean... How many problems can we, can we uh, name? You know, we, this, this, this audience could not name all of the problems found in the judicial branch of our government. It is a criminal justice system with criminal in caps as compared to the Bible's criminal justice system, justice all in caps. And you know it as well as I do. We don't even have to be debating about the Constitution and you know it's a criminal justice system under the Constitution. Always has been, always bill will be, and only to get worse because we're in the whirlwind effect. The whirlwind only intensifies it until we get rid of the wind that created it. The ironic part of all of this is that we've got Christians and patriots across this land that are trying to dissipate the whirlwind by appealing to the wind that created it. It won't work, folks. Never has, never will. It's impossible. We've got to get back. We need to. We need lawyers. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the Bible was uh, was written for those who were born again and how we judge each other in, in an ecclesiastic society in the New York area. Those who are outside of that are outside of the jurisdiction of the Bible. How does an ecclesia control or deal with people of lawlessness that outside their jurisdiction? And the Constitution says that only it only works if the people are moral people. So how do, how does the biblical 
Ecclesiastes deal with other people in the world that's living in the land, and uh, how do we do it? Is it justice? How do we get jurisdiction over them? Is this question for Ted? Uh, uh, yes, it was Ted. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not sure how pertinent that all was, but I will say that uh, the Constitution does not say it was only made for immoral people. That's a quote from John Adams that's often used by Christians. It's a, it's a great example of the constitutional framers being cherry-picked. Um, and it was Adams, I don't have the, the specific quote, but you hear it all the time, that John Adams made this statement about the morality, you know, the Constitution is invalid without the morality of the people. And Christians use it as if he's talking about Christian morality. Well, I always provide, when I deal with that question, two, quotes, two other quotes from Adams, in which he is not talking about Christian morality, he's just talking about general morality, was the, which was the case with almost all of the founders and framers. They all appealed to reason, nearly all of them, I shouldn't say all of them. The, only, the one that certainly didn't was, was Patrick Henry, who most people are not aware of, refused to attend the Constitutional Convention saying, I smelt a rat. That's a quote. He, it was smelt, S-M-E-L-T. I smelt a rat and opposed it. E and, and the, the anti-federalist, you look at the anti-federalist arguments, those who are opposed, some of them walked away from the Constitution. Luther Martin did from Maryland. Walked away and, and joined Patrick Henry in opposing it at the Maryland State uh, uh, ratifying conventions. You look at the, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the arguments or against the Constitution by the anti-federalist, every one of them has come true. And for, for Patrick Henry's, you need to go to chapter three in this. It is an incredible commentary is a criminal is an incredible prophetic statement of where we find ourselves today what he said would come from the constitution yes the bill of rights were added yes patrick henry added finally added his regrettably added his signature to the, to them or his vote for them keep in mind keep in mind that those that are called the founders the framers all those fellows were politicians. The job of a politician is to tell people what they think. Repeat back to them what they're thinking. If you don't do that, you won't stay in office, period. How do I know? I've tried it. <laughs> you've got to tell people, you've got to repeat back, put into words what they're thinking. They don't put them into words, and when you do that, then they support you. <laughs> Case in point. Common sense. What was that fellow's name? Yeah, you know him. You talk about a godless man. Woo! He'd make your hair curl. His morality, because it would knock a buzzard off the side of a manure wagon. Patrick Henry wrote, though, the book, Common Sense, the pamphlet. And the whole book was an argument from the Older Testament as to why we don't need a king. Very good arguments. He knew the Bible well. Hated it. Didn't believe it. At his funeral, nobody showed up, maybe a half a dozen people, because they felt bad. He went to revolutionary France and supported the evil empire. Did he say the right things? Yeah, he said the right things, and people liked it, because it was what they were thinking. Because Americans were biblical. Who's responsible for the Constitution of the United States? Adams, Washington, no, 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 no. The ratifiers, the three million people of the United, the militia, of the several states of the United States voted. They voted for that document because they believed it was compatible with the Bible. And as I'd said before, over 98% were either English Puritans and Congregationalists, Scotch-Irish Presbyterians, or German and Dutch Reform people, about a million apiece. And all of them were Reformed Bible believers. Thank you. Brent, stay at the microphone, please. Here's a question from someone on the live stream. It's actually for both of you. And since he's there, I'll let him go first. Sure. One, one of the early justices said, the Constitution can't be understood unless one understands the common law. Question for both. Where does the common law come from? The common law comes from the sky, from the maker of all things. When he created all things, he established the relationships between things and things, Things and men, and men and men. Go to the volume, first volume, Blackstone. He goes into great detail describing 
those two volumes. And he also defines for us the meaning in that day of the phrase, the laws of nature and the laws of nature's God. The laws of nature are common law, unwritten, the lex non scripta, and the laws of nature's God, the Bible, or as he calls it, revealed religion. How much time, Charlie? You still have another minute. Oh, I'll yield to Ted. Well, I wish I had it with me. Uh, uh, Blackstone is just another example of a guy that's been cherry-picked, and Christians just take what they want and forget all the rest. Um, I also have, uh, let me find out which chapter it is. In the Bible Law versus the United States Constitution, the Christian Perspective. Again, this is on, online. If you, or if you don't, ha don't want the book itself, um, you can go to Bible versus V-E-R-S-U-S, constitution.org, and uh, you can find the book on our online book page and download it or read it right there if you want to do it from the computer. Anyway, uh, the common law is dealt with in one of these chapters, if I can find it quickly. And I would even read some of it to you. And uh, there was great, there was great uh, dissension over what the common law was. And uh, there were those of the founders who believed it had nothing to do with the Bible, and there were those who did, which um, should tell you something about <clears throat> these men, obviously, <clears throat> were not in agreement, <clears throat> not only on the common law, <clears throat> but they weren't representing it. Um, they were, they were not representing it as uh, necessarily a biblical establishment. Again, I, I'm going to have a hard time finding what chapter it is, um, unless somebody knows which. Do you know which, uh, which article or amendment the common law is mentioned? In the Constitution of the United States? Yeah. It's not mentioned. It just is. What's that? Oh, the Seventh Amendment according to the course of the common law. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Seventh Amendment. I'm going to probably run out of time here to be able to do this, but let's see if I can get to it here quickly. I'm sorry? Chapter Amendment. What I wanted to do is I wanted to read this. It's a short chapter. I wanted to read actually right from it about the, about the uh, common law. Uh, amendments 14. Well, I'm not going to be able to, but I can, I can encourage you that you, you'll find that I deal with the common law in this book, and uh, you can read for yourself some of the quotations from the founders and how they really uh, looked upon it. we got time for one last question. <clears throat> wow, what a privilege. Uh, question is for Brent. Uh, in the scriptures, the, uh, the Almighty said, my law is perfect. You shall not add or subtract therefrom. In the U.S. Constitution and all state constitutions, there is provision for uh, Congress, the legislature, to legislate. Isn't that exactly what they do? They're able to make, to change, add or subtract from his law. Well, our Constitution of the United States, our common law, the Constitution of the United States is a slice, a significant slice of our common law called the common law of government. When in Israel, when the law of God as written, the Lex Scripta, when they applied it to a particular instance, a particular case, and they made a judgment that became guidance, just as it does in our common law tradition. Stare decisis. We go to court opinions in our common law trad tradition. They don't do that in the rest of the world. No, no. Matter of fact, it's forbidden, forbidden by the strongest of traditions. You do not refer to what a former court said. Well, that's all we do in America. Why? Because we're looking for that application. There's law, there's law, and there's application. The application of the law in individual instances may be a problem that has never risen before and we don't know what to do with it. That's what happened with the daughters of Zolo. Zolo, what's that fellow's name? Had those daughters that got disinherited because they didn't have any brothers and the law had said that, the law said that sons inherit. It didn't say daughters didn't, so Moses corrected that and they came, they said, this is a case of first impression. Zolo, I don't know how to pronounce his name. But the daughters came to Moses and said, look, we should receive the inheritance. Well, that was a case of first impression. So he said he would consult with 
the Lord himself, and he did. And he came back and said, no, you do inherit. You don't have brothers, then you get the inheritance. That happens all, all throughout history. And in a common law world like we live in, we have thousands and hundreds of thousands of cases that we use in the courts because we're talking about not the statute, not the, the common law standard, for example, we say it's a common law standard, uh, burglary or whatever. Well, I'm out of time just to say this. The popular perceptions of what the common law is, most of them aren't true. The common law is process, due process is our common law. Well, we were talking, I think, I may have, I may have uh, not got the question quite right, but I was, it, you know, we're talking, some of this is talking about the, well, the, the question had to do with that God's law cannot be amended, and whereas the Constitution is, that in itself should tell you something. I do deal with that in the book as well. Um, and uh, I want you to think about not only the amendments, but Article 6, that the Supreme Court, or excuse me, the Supreme Law is not only the Constitution, nor the 27 amendments, but it's all law, quote unquote law, made in pursuance thereof, made by fickle finite men without the basis of the Bible, that sometimes is kept, sometimes is lost, but everything that has not been annulled at some point via the judicial system, the legislative, legislative system, um, is a part of the supreme law today. I want you to think about that. Roe versus Wade, it's a part of the supreme law until it's overturned. Now you can say it was, it was not done constitutionally, you know, uh, that's going to be an argument, um, but they should be saying it wasn't done biblically. The, the, it's, it's the argument between is it constitution or is it biblical? Which one are you going to go with? I suggest you go with is, this con is it biblical? And because they're not, they're not starting from the foundation of the Bible, we've got every, the, 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 uh, the supreme law, well, I, I put it this way. You know, if Moses had come down Mount Sinai with today's constitutional law, I guarantee he wouldn't have come down the, the mountain with ten tablets, or excuse me, two tablets. He'd have come down with a hernia, a busted back, and an untold nor number of wagons the pulled by... The session from the audience has ended. I'm going to give you guys one minute to prepare your closing, to prepare for closing. Ted goes first, he gets ten minutes, followed by Brett with ten, followed by Ted with five. So I'm going to give you one minute to get ready, okay? Brent's not leaving as soon as it's over. So if any of you guys have any more questions for Brent, Brent has agreed to take your questions. Same thing with Ted. We won't use the microphone, Randy. We're going to conclude as soon as this is over. Are you ready, Ted? I am. If you're ready, we'll go ahead and start. Ted, you've got 10 minutes for a conclusion. OK, I'm going to first begin by finishing what I was. I didn't, I had about three more words to say. But again, let me just repeat it, because I, I, I want you to get it. If, if Moses had come down Mount Sinai with today's constitutional laws, he would not have come down with two tablets. He'd have come down with a busted back and an untold number of wagons pulled by both donkeys and elephants. Hopefully you get the point. An untold number. I mean, they don't know the number of laws on the book that, are, that, that the supreme law consists of right now until they're either... Uh, rid, gotten rid of in some fashion or an, another. Um, you know, would, would we have even Roe v. Wade if, if, if uh, the constant, uh, excuse me, if government had been like what we had in the, in the early 1600s, a government of, by, and for God expressly established upon his law, including Exodus 26, 2016, 21, 22 through 23, and Deuteronomy 27, 25. You can look those up on your own. But, I mean, if those had been the law of the land, you, well, I'm going to get into my, my five minutes there, but, so I'll wait for that on, on the point I was just going to make. But, 
But you know the answer to that. If that had been made the law of the land like it had been in the early 1600s, which is a biblical government? Which, which ends with the results that we know are biblical and which, which, which results in, the, in what we have today, nearly the 100% of what is totally unbiblical, ungodly, and, and scripturally seditious? I mean, you should only be able to see the difference between what the two documents have given us. I've talked about, about uh, the, the, the founders or framers uh, being cherry-picked. Here's another one. This, this, yeah, I'm going to give you the rest of the story. This is the rest of the story as uh, Paul Harvey should have told and never did tell. You know, you often hear, you, I hear all the time, the argument that, hey, this, these guys were Christian men. They prayed. I mean, you remember Benjamin Franklin. He prayed at the Constitutional Convention. Things had gone so awry, and he prayed. Or he, excuse me, he suggested that they pray. The rest of the story is they didn't. And he records it in his own notes about the Constitution that only two or three voted for them to pray for the, pray for the Constitutional Convention and the Constitution they were created. How many have heard the rest of the story? Well, you can read the rest of the story in here because I quote it and I give the document. Everything I put in here that's not me is documented. We cannot valid, biblically validate the Constitution by any other means than the Constitution itself. And it's impossible to do so because there is only one acknowledgement of the Lord, and it's in the time statement. The best they could make, make him, even if this is what they had intended. Perhaps it was nothing more than dating the document in the fashion that was common of the day. But even if they intended to give him credit in the dating of the document, in the year of the Lord, such and such, the best they could do was make him the timekeeper. Now you tell me that's a biblical document. I'll conclude with that. Brent, you have 10 minutes. Please, please use the same microphone that Ted is using. Yes, thank you. Well, they told me when I was a kid in the school, if you're going to make a presentation, say what you're going to say, then say it, and then say what you said. I don't say anything new. I just keep saying the same things over and over again, hopefully in different ways, so it doesn't bore you to tears. I talked about due process. The Constitution of the United States is a brief of common law government. God has given jurisdiction to men, not for the end result standard. Example, do not covet, lie, steal, commit adultery, or murder your neighbor. That's the end result standard. That's the end result. That's his jurisdiction, not mine. What's my jurisdiction? To insist that the proper process is followed. How do I know what the process is in every case? I don't. The Constitution is just a small slice, a significant in sense of importance. The Constitution of the United States doesn't lay out law. The states do that. You want to know what murder is in your state? Go look at what the common law standard is in the state for murder, the one the courts have recognized here in Missouri. I've sat in the Missouri Supreme Court and listened to the arguments in murder cases. Their standard is pretty much the standard of every other state, but the process, there's no debate about murder. Is it, it, it's, you're not supposed to do that. God said, and the government says too, and everybody else that's here says, the problem is how do you decide who's committed murder? I was involved in a case once where a fellow was being tried for murder, being tried for murder, and they didn't know whether he had done it on the Indian reservation or on the other side of the road because he did it in a pickup truck that was driving, and they didn't know where the truck was and who had jurisdiction. That's the way we do things. The Constitution of the United States divides jurisdiction. Yeah. And the Indian reservations are a different jurisdiction than the, us folk living out here in the states. Yeah. The division of powers, that's what it's all about. The arrangement of rights, that's what it's all about. What is due process? It is the course, as the, as the Northwest Ordinance of 17 and 87 puts it, the course of the common law. Before the Constitution of the United States was 
pinned the men that met for the first time in Congress assembled at Annapolis, Maryland, 14 October 1774. 14 October 1774, get that date, keep that in mind. They wrote a letter over to the other side of the pond, the king and parliament and all their cronies. And they said, we plead with you that we're entitled to the rights, that is the duties, the responsibilities, that's what rights are, of our common law. And most especially, the right, the duty we have to conduct trial by jury, comma, according to the course of our common law. According to the course? Yeah, that's the process, you see, the road, the way you do it. And they said, we are entitled to the rights, I forgot this word, of our Constitution. Our Constitution. Well, the Constitution wasn't going to be pinned until 1787, ratified 1789, and 11 years later, what in the Sam Hill were they talking about our Constitution? Well, in England, yet today, they call their Constitution their, the common law. The common law is one of the greatest blessings we've ever, as Americans, we have. Because it gives us, it recognizes, no, it doesn't give us anything. God gave it to us. It recognizes the jurisdiction he gave us as members of the militia to be precisely about we the people and the two duties of the militia. Jury duty in defense of the law of the land and armed defense in defense of the land. You can't separate the two. The land, the law comes to the land and then it's expressed. The land's special. How special is it? God applied the Sabbath principle to himself after he created all things. Then he applied the Sabbath principle to the crowning of his creation, mankind. And then there was one other thing he applied it to. What was it? The land. The land is everything to our maker. His land is precious. He gives us land. And he gives us the law of the land in support of the proper way to not pollute the land. If you don't, people say, I'm for capital punishment. Oh, yeah. Is anybody talking about the process that is required to convict someone of a capital crime? <laughs> You know, in all of Israel, outside of the Bible, there's no record outside of the Bible of anybody being stoned to death. Now, the only reason I can come up with, uh, come up with that, a reason for that, is that if you follow the process that God wants in criminal cases, there'd be few convictions. Few. The governor of Illinois went to prison for five years, George Ryan. What did he do? He put a moratorium on the death penalty because he said, look, separation of powers, I'm the executive branch. I don't have to do what any of you other two branches say. By the way, it's amazing. We've been bamboozled. I like that word, Ted. Bamboozled into believing that the Supreme Court of the United States trumps Congress and the president. It doesn't. There's nothing in our Constitution. That's our common law standard. Separate but equal branches of government. Each branch growing out of that tree called the Constitution of the United States, rooted deep in our common law. Each branch independent, getting its sap independently, doesn't have to depend on the other branches. No, the Supreme Court is not the final word on anything. And every president we've ever had has ignored certain findings of the Supreme Court of the United States. They just don't tell you. Because a man named Beard, who was a Quaker and a communist, back about 1910 wrote a book saying the Supreme Court was final, and the Supreme Court's even quoting that book now. That is not our common... We are not even a republic. No, republic and democracy, synonymous to the Greeks, the ones that invented those words. Do we have a republican form of government? Yes, but we're not a republic. The USSR, communist USSR, socialist republic, communist republic, the people's republic, French revolutionary republic, that's not who we are. No, we're a common law country. We have a republican form guaranteed to the states. Our constitution says that. What does that mean? That means you have a legislative body. They're not the lawgivers. No, the lawgiver, traditionally, the God, is the final decider of right and wrong in individual instances from whose decision there is no appeal. Well, who's that in a common law country? 
the jury. The jury does not exist anywhere else in the world. We're blessed. You know, the only person that has authority to gather all three powers of government, legislative, executive, and judicial, into a single set of hands is who? Jesus Christ. And any time in the Bible somebody tried that, they were judged immediately. King Saul, good example. He prophesied. That's the legislative function. He was king. That's the executive function. And then what did he try to do? He tried to make sacrifices. That's the judicial function. And you know what happened? God ripped the kingdom from him. That's the word. That's the Hebrew word. It means the rip. He just tore it from him. But here, now, before the Messiah gets here, our responsibility as government, as men, members of the militia. Now you say, I don't believe that, Brent. I believe the gals have something to do with this. Oh, they got a lot to do with it, but we're not talking about that right now. And I'm just reporting what the Bible says and what the Constitution of the United States says. I like words. I think you probably do here. Will I get time to thank all concerned? Charlie? Charlie? What, do I have this the last talk and I get to do? I want to thank Charlie because he's been really helpful to Ted and I. We had a, one or two disagreements and we submitted them to Charlie because he's the referee here. And he judiciously, quickly, and intelligently and fairly resolved the problem. We planned it well thanks to Charlie. Charlie, I wish you could get up here because I got friends that want to see you. Can you come up in front of the camera? Ted still has five minutes. Ted's, Ted what? Ted still has five minutes. Oh, well, will you come up when we're done? On the way you're talking, I'll extend as much time as you want. <laughs> oh, I could think of a lot of nice things to say about you, Charlie. Some of it be lies, but I could say it. Okay. Thank you. Brent, I have nice things to say about you as well. <laughs> Ted, you've got five minutes to conclude. Oh boy, would I ever like to respond to the comments he made about abortion, the land, rights, and uh, capital punishment, but I don't have time, I've only got five minutes. It's crucial that we understand that there are no moral vacuums anywhere in life, including the Constitution. There are no moral vacuums, and there is only one ethical standard by which everything, including the Constitution, must be examined. That, of course, being the Almighty God's immutable morality as reflected in his commandments, <clears throat> excuse me, statutes and judgments. When examined by this standard, there's hardly an article or amendment that's not antithetical, if not seditious, to Yahweh's sovereignty and morality. Again, I reference the book that's been written, and I think it's proven, and you'll see that it's proven therein. But the sins of the framers were not merely sins of commission. Their sins were of omission as well. And America was sold down the river, sent to, on her suicidal trek to the precipice by the framers' sins of omission alone. Jeremiah 2.13, if you would, for the, for the slide. I won't, well, I'll read it to you. It says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. There has no water been held by this Constitution. It's a broken cistern from the very beginning. It cannot hold water, and that's why America is on the precipice right now. For example, had the framers established a government of by and for God, like in the early 1600s, based upon, the moral, upon his moral law, beginning with the first commandment, there would, again, be no mosque in America from which some of our posterity will in invariably be proselytized to their false god. Had they furthermore established a government based upon the Sixth Commandment and its statutes, including Exodus 20, 13, 21, 22 through 13, and others, no one would have ever heard of Roe versus Wade, Planned Parenthood wouldn't exist, and millions of slaughtered infants in their mother's womb would have lived to see the light of day. Had they established a government on God's unchanging law, including the Bible's mandatory biblical qualifications for civil leaders, and no one would have heard of Obama, the Clintons, Pelosi, Ginsburg, etc., 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 nor endured any of their ungodly, abominable legislation and adjudication. And the list of examples is nearly endless because of the framers' sins of omission. 
Thus, even if the Constitution itself wasn't the biblically egregious document it is, by the founding fathers' sins of omission alone, it was inevitable that America would find herself teetering precipitously on the precipice of moral depravity and destruction. Now, I ask you, I ask you, boy, I got more time. Now, but we're going to end here. Now, I ask you, those of you who came to this debate to support the Constitution, certainly, certainly, you're not going to leave doing the same. Because if you do, you will also leave without Christ as your king. There's only one supreme, and therefore only one supreme law, one law, period. Everything else, including the Constitution, is merely man legalizing what God has dictated as unlawful, in utero infanticide, sodomite marriages, quote-unquote marriages, etc., and making illegal what God has deemed lawful or even mandatory, mandatory biblical qualifications for civil leaders, for example. Consequently, to look to, promote, or even condone any, any law but our king's law, or any law not in harmony with our king's law, is an act of idolatry and thus sedition against the king, the king of kings. If we hope, if we intend to leave our posterity in America like the early 1600s, we must be Gideons and tear down our American forefathers' national idol with the intention of someday replacing it with our sovereign's perfect law and altogether righteous judgments. Per Deuteronomy 4, 5, and 8. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. Psalms 19, 7 through 9, and Romans 13, 1 through 7, and many, many others. I truly, truly hope you'll join me in the good fight for king and kingdom. God bless you in your endeavors to do so. I'm going to end with this and just let you know again, we're going to have some men at the doors. If you don't already have a primer, the 85-page primer of Bible law versus the United States Constitution, they're going to be handing them out. You're welcome to it, um, um, free for the taking. And there's, of course, the book table's back there with a lot of other relative material as well. Appreciate you all coming, and uh, appreciate, again, Charlie putting this all together. And, this and, and Brent. This comment came in from Daryl Wayne. Both of these men are such fine examples of proper judgment. Ken and I have known each other for a long time. This is Deb, and he's a videographer. Do you have a website, Ken? No, but he's good at it, been doing it all his life, <clears throat> ever since he got out of the Army. And uh, he's agreed to come over and record this, so apparently what we're maybe going to try to do is load it in YouTube unless it's already there. I don't understand how that works. But maybe we can put it on the website, commonlawyer.com, when we find out. Also, in addition to Ted's books, then you can go back and talk to the pretty girl back here. The prettiest girl in the world. She's definitely prettier than you. <laughs> that goes without saying. And your wife is the second prettiest girl to her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, my wife's the prettiest. Oh. Oh boy, that's going to open up the whole audience. <clears throat> well, Charlie, will you come up so my friends can see you? Charlie was the, well, he's uh, hey, without him. As he's coming up, Ken and his wife need him. Thank you. Thank you. This is Charlie A. Stewart of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's your name. That's it. That's it. <laughs> and that's something. Well, thank you very much, all. Thank you for coming. I know some came from far away. Nobody came as far as me, though. I was in Paso Robles, California, three days ago, and I drove. Now, somebody came from the San Francisco Bay Area and flew, but that didn't count. <laughs> I agree. Oh, you flew? Okay. No, I say I agree. It doesn't oh, count. no, that doesn't count. Although flying can be dangerous these days with all the mask and the shaking you down and all. But thank you so much, and...
it, by the way, is Sam Britton here? Sam. Oh, there's Sam. Well, Sam, I'll chat with you. Sam has all three of us on the radio, Missouri Liberty Radio. And Sam's sitting there with the white stick sticking up. Is Trish here? Yeah. There's Trish right there. Okay. That's his wife, Trish. We appreciate him, too. That, that stick is for Trish beating on him. He's out of line. <laughs> well, my, my voice is played out. If anybody else got anything to say. I'm all right. Pray. How about let's all stand for a closing word of prayer? Wayne, why don't you run up here real quick and, and lead us in prayer? Gary, will you lead us in prayer? Just, you can just stay right there. Gary, just lead us in prayer right there. Sure. All right. Heavenly Father, we just come to you tonight thanking you that uh, you are the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And uh, all power, honor, and glory is yours. Amen. Father, we just uh, pray that you remove the sin from our lives and uh, make us repent. Second Chronicles 7 14. You heal our land and uh, bring about your laws into our, just where we live right here and across your globe. Father, just uh, be with each and every one as we travel tonight going home, those that are staying for tomorrow, and uh, bless these speakers, and uh, just ask all praise, all glory, and honor to you. In Amen. your son's name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. I realize we did go a little over, but we're still having a bonfire out there, and refreshments next door if you want to stick around.